Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week I'm joined by Jack Moore. He's the former chef at Watershed Distillery Kitchen and Bar here in Columbus, Ohio. He recently left that restaurant kind of at the beginning of the year, started his own company during COVID, Ruffled Feathered Ferments. And most notably, the signature product that they have is Black Cap Hot Sauce. We talk about his career up till now, why he started this company what his plans are for it in the future, how he developed Black Cap Hot Sauce. You know, he grew up near a farm doing some farming and stuff like that. You know, always kind of near ingredients and background of just fermenting too as well. And he worked here in Columbus for a while and then went up to Cleveland, worked at the Greenhouse Tavern and a few other restaurants up there too as well that were notable and and wound up coming back down and running Watershed for a little over five years, I think, and then um, recently decided to leave. But he's not gone from the kitchen forever, just kind of temporarily for now. So we get into all that stuff, really eye-opening episode two as well. So if you don't know much about Jack or his career or anything like that, kind of covers Columbus and Cleveland pretty well too. So you can follow him on Instagram at J underscore more 87, and then also at Black Cap Hot Sauce. You can find the hot sauce at pretty much any local kind of market, Lawbird Supply House, Coastal Local Seafood, Saddleburg, the butcher place up in the Bridge Park North Market. I think you might be able to find it at Wylands. You can definitely find it at the Hills Market downtown. So any kind of local grocer, you should be able to find it. It is usually in the refrigerated section, wherever they have it, a little kind of cooler section too as well. And it's a pretty standout bottle, so pretty easy to find. You can also follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob. We're on Twitter and Facebook, Spoon Mob One on those platforms. Check out the website, spoonmob.com. We have a bunch of information on different chefs, their contact information, Instagram handles, different food photos are up on their pages too. The newest page is always on top. That's the most recently released episode. Kind of going back to the oldest would be at the bottom and the different categories. You can also email us, spoonmob at yahoo.com, or send in uh, questions, comments, feedback through the website. There's a contact portal there too as well. Without any further delay, here's my conversation with Chef Jack Moore of Ruffled Feather Ferments here in Columbus, Ohio. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. Come up uh, a few different times. Some people have recommended uh, reach out to you and, and what you got going on now. Ate at Watershed a few times why you're the chef there. And we know some people that that's pretty high up on their list of favorite restaurants in Columbus uh, when you were there too as well. But now you're on hot sauce, which we're going to get into just because I know nothing about that world. So I'm pretty interested. Before we get there, you know, how did you first get started cooking? I mean, you grew up on like a family farm of sorts, right? I use the farm term kind of loosely. I mean, it was more like just growing up out in the country. By no means was my family farmers. They're factory workers, but we always had a massive garden, not just a little bit, but like a garden big enough to feed the community. So like we always had like a little roadside stand selling kind of your classic things that you'd find out in the country, like your green beans, corn, tomatoes kind of thing. So very much just for something that my parents did to kind of pass the time. It wasn't a way of making living or anything like that, but from a very early stage in my life, it kind of connected me to, you know, what you can do with food, you know, like you can grow it and you can preserve it and you eat it and it's so, you know, it wasn't a huge part of my childhood in the sense of like, I didn't, at that point in time, I didn't recognize it as something that I was going to carry on as a career, but it wasn't until later in my life that I appreciated those things, appreciated, uh, you know, being the teenager, younger, you know, having to go out to the garden with dad and, and, and weed it and, and till it and all that kind of stuff it wasn't until much later in life. I appreciated that. Yeah. Grew up out in the country. Cooking wasn't my first job. I was an auto mechanic right out of high school. Took Happily took a layoff. The economy kind of went in the, in the shitter a little bit in like the 2008, 2009 time, specifically for the automotive world. And I just, I was young, like 18, 19 years old, didn't manage my money very well. And as a mechanic, you know, who, who does it at that stage, right? But as a mechanic, uh, you make what's called a flat rate, which means basically, you know, if you bring your car in for this specific job, whether it takes me two hours or 20 minutes, I get the same amount of time paid. That is, I just had a huge fluctuation of paychecks, like one week, 1500, next week, 800, 1000, 200. And I, I didn't manage myself well with that scenario. So happily took a layoff out of the automotive world. And the day literally that I got laid off uh, from being an auto mechanic, I got a job delivering pizzas. Uh, I showed up to a bar that morning at like a bar that my friend group hung out at. And uh, it was like the weekend of an OSU Michigan game, I think. So the bar was open early, having like a tailgate party on a, on a like Friday or Saturday. And my buddy who ran the pizza shop was like, dude, what are you, aren't you supposed to be at work? Why are you here? 
and uh, gave him the rundown how I just got laid off. He was like, well, I don't think my delivery driver is going to show up tonight. Uh, so if you want to make some extra change while you find another job, deliver pizzas. So I was like, sweet, perfect. I'll take it. And that was like really my first kitchen job delivering pizzas. And it was this little pizza place in Dublin called Classics. And there, I think there's still some classics around town here in Columbus, but I don't, I, that one, I don't think exists anymore. It wasn't like necessarily like a from scratch kitchen necessarily. Like they made their dough, they made the sauce and there was like peppers, the chop and stuff like that. And that was my job. There wasn't any pizzas to be delivered. I would just get ahead on that prep stuff. And I was like, well, you know, this is it's kind of fun. Like I always loved to cook growing up. Like I mentioned, like I was always around food, but Growing up, it was kind of uh, more about convenience, you know, a lot of canned items, the box items that, the, you know, we were definitely a hamburger helper household. I love to make that. I love to follow a recipe. Like I always tell this joke, that it was a true, but I mean, on the side of like the hamburger helper box, you'll see like substitutions and add green pepper to make it zesty and like stuff like that. But I, I loved doing that as a kid. It was kind of like the same satisfaction almost in the sense of working with my hands. Like as a mechanic, somebody would bring me a car that's broken. I would tinker with it to fix it, make something out of this broken mess. A recipe was kind of the same thing. Like here are all these ingredients that need put together to make, you know, here's a mess to make this work. And, you know, somehow in my head that kind of like both are very instant gratifying careers, you know, like you, you either fix it or you don't. And, you know, you either make a good dish or you don't. I just kind of thought to myself, maybe I don't want to go back into the automotive world. Maybe I could go into the route of the food industry. And at that time, I literally had zero idea what that meant, or even that there was like different levels of restaurant. Like in my head, you know, at that time, like there was no difference between McDonald's, Olive Garden, and whatever fine dining restaurant there was in Columbus. I don't even know that I had been to anything at that point in time. It wasn't until I got into culinary school and started actually working in kitchens that I realized there are some drastically different restaurants and avenues that you could take within the hospitality industry. So yeah, while I was at the, at the pizza shop, someone else there was interested in going to culinary school and they were going to take a test, uh, like an admissions test. And I just went with them one day just for, just for shits, basically. And I ended up being accepted if I wanted to go. And it was just a culinary school here in town. So it's not like it was a big prize school or anything like that. Just on a whim, I just like, well, what, what, what do I have to do right now? Like, I, I'm, I'm a delivery driver. I was probably 21 or 20 years old at that time. Went to culinary school. My first year in culinary school... I pretty much worked every type of kitchen job there was to deliver from that pizza cooking to fast food to steakhouse and eventually landed my first like kind of real chef driven kitchen job in probably like 2010 or 11, I'm guessing it was, which is where I feel like I really kind of cut my teeth. That was, that was Sage, Sage American Bistro, uh, Bill Glover's spot that he had down in what's that area of town called, it's not Clintonville, I guess, Old North, right on High Street. I transitioned from, you know, growing up auto mechanic to first job. But once I found the the chef driven world of cooking, I never really left that side of cooking. I never went into catering or in the fast food back after that. Once I found that, and I don't really call it fine dining either. It's kind of like just elevated semi-fine dining chef driven world that that spoke to me. And I just engulfed myself in it from that point on in an unhealthy way. So with culinary school, you said you went and took the test just kind of on a whim. Did you ever do any research on other culinary schools? You wound up going to the Bradford School, which is now closed. Previously, it was called the Columbus Culinary Institute before the name changed and everything. Was it just they would take you like, oh, yeah, they're going to take me. So let's just go here. Or did you kind of look around at anybody else? Before the day that we went to take the admissions test, I don't think I had even thought about culinary school. Like I said, the guy I was working with was talking about it. I was like, ah, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't shop around at all for that. I honestly, I've never even thought about that until right now. You asking that, like, I don't, I don't know why I didn't shop around. It was just a total weird time in my life, you know, and wasn't sure what I was going to do. Stay in the, I really didn't want to go back into the automotive world. So at that time, it was probably just an easy decision for me to be like, oh, here's this opportunity. I'm going to take it right now. I like to ask this question to most of the chefs that come on the podcast. I think I actually ask it to all of them. If somebody in your kitchen comes up to you and says, hey, I'm serious about becoming a chef. I want to own a restaurant of my own one day. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? It depended upon what their experience was. For me, culinary school is definitely not needed. I think you get way more valuable experience actually just being in a kitchen and working. But for me, having never have been in the restaurant world, 
it was just like a punch in the face of information every day. Like I was seeing ingredients that I'd never saw before. I was hearing techniques that I'd never heard of before because I didn't grow up in a, in that type of household that was, that I got to experience a lot of that. Now, when someone tells me they're going to culinary school now, the first thing I tell them to do if they have no experience is to go to a high volume restaurant like the Olive Gardens of the world and wash dishes for six months. And if you think you still want to work in a kitchen after that, then go to culinary school or getting to a, a higher, more glamorous or more prestige kitchen or, or, or whatever it's kind of floats your boat. But there's nothing glorious about working in big kitchens like that. And there's nothing glorious about working in a kitchen at all. Like it's hard. It's hot. It's long hours. It's repetitive. And it's kind of gross sometimes, you know, working a dish pit in a high volume restaurant, like you're soaking wet with dishwater, you got food pieces stuck to you. And that's life in a restaurant. And no matter where you are in the restaurant, you know, even if you're the chef of a restaurant, when the dishwasher doesn't show up, someone's got to go over there and do that. And you have to be okay with doing that. If I get the vibe that someone's got the impression that they're going to go to culinary school and they're going to come out and be on Food Network, go wash dishes somewhere and see how you feel about this career. Yeah, I don't have anything against culinary school, but if you're someone that's working fast food since you've been a teenager and you're now in your mid-20s and you still want to grow in your career, you probably don't need to go to culinary school. If you really want to refine some of your like vocabulary and or if you want to teach or something like that, like go for it. But I don't think it's necessary to be successful in art. How did you wind up at Sage American Bistro? Did you find out it was opening and apply or did someone recommend you go check that place out, send in your resume, or did you have a connection that kind of got you in there? Craigslist. I think I was currently working two jobs. One was at Chipotle, which was the hardest job I ever had. I think the other one was maybe Hyde Park, uh, the steakhouse. And I was just every day kind of cruising Craigslist to see what was available. And then again, at this time, I was just learning the different types of restaurants. Like obviously, I was, so I was working at Chipotle and a Hyde Park, two drastically different models, two drastically different menus. So like I was literally just learning. So I'm, I'm looking at Craigslist every day and it was an anonymous ad. It was like restaurant on high street looking for entry level line cook. And anything that I saw like that, I would just apply. So I had no idea what I was applying to. There was no name of the restaurant attached or anything like that. And basically, Bill, the owner, chef owner called me uh, like, hey, I got your email. Or I got your response to the Craigslist ad. Basically gave me a little quick 20, 30 minute phone interview. You know, I passed this phone interview. So he brought me in to do a, what we call stage in our industry or, you know, work a cooking interview. And his was like mystery basket style. So basically walked in, he had a hotel pan that had random 10 ingredients in it and was like, make me an appetizer and, a, and an entree that utilizes at least all the ingredients in here. You don't have to use the whole ingredient, but make sure you have at least something of each ingredient somewhere and had like an hour and a half to do it. I presented him and the, what was the general manager of, of Sage at that time. So it was nerve wracking. It's the first time I'd ever like professionally cooked for another professional. I don't even, rem I kind of remember what I made, but I, I, I don't. And there was other people. I think there was like two or three other students from Bradford that was interviewing for that same job. So literally, like as I was coming in to do that, there was a Bradford student leaving who had just finished doing the same thing that I was about to do. I had no idea whether I was going to get the job or not. But after doing the after doing the cooking interview, a day later, Bill called me and said I had the job. And starting out at Sage, I was still in school. So I was just coming there in the evening, I would do the salad station or garmage. We call it the garm station. Re really simple stuff, desserts. And I was like the dishwasher on weekends. Uh, and eventually, I just be taking on more and more responsibility. You know, Sage was very small. It was it's pretty much like a two to three man crew in the kitchen in there. And when I got there, there were some things. Everything was great. But there were some things that I saw that I could maybe do. For instance, I was in like the dessert class at the time in Bradford. When we first started Sage, I think I came in the Sage like just a couple months after it opened. So it was almost at the beginning of Sage. Like he is, he was already open, but I wasn't the opening crew, but very close to the beginning. And in the beginning, we, we bought all of our desserts from a, a gal right down the street. I don't remember the name of her bakery. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore, but she did like cheesecakes and some other stuff. And we bought everything that was accompanying that, you know, like the chocolate sauces and whatnot. So, you know, one day I learned how to make caramel sauce in culinary school and I come in and I'm like, Hey, I think I can make this caramel sauce that we're buying. Let me, let me try. So I literally just started like picking up projects like that to try to help what I was learning to be a scratch kitchen. So yeah, eventually, eventually I just worked myself up in the role at Sage and took on more responsibilities. And Bill eventually gave me the title of the sous chef there. I totally ran the dessert program there. I, I didn't want the title of dessert or like a pastry chef, even though that was my responsibility. It's that I didn't want to end up a pastry chef in, in the culinary world, but I had no problem doing that. So I was a sous chef there and I stayed there until it closed. It was just like a little over four years. I 
learned a lot there. I learned, I learned a, a set of standards there that I don't, I wouldn't have learned in culinary school. Being a first time sous chef there, you know, as you elevate up to that role and obviously take it on the pastry program, what was the biggest challenge or kind of one thing that you remember the most that you learned being in that role where you're managing other chefs for the first time and managing an entire department too, as well, even though it's a small restaurant, it's still the entire department. I mean, honestly, what I learned the most there was just, it wasn't about managing people as managing myself. I didn't really have a person to manage because like I said, it was basically when Bill was actually in the kitchen cooking in the beginning, it was just him, me and another guy. That was, was it. And then there was the front of the house staff. And eventually as Bill migrated out and took the job at Hilton, all that kind of stuff, it was me, that other guy and whatever other person we, you know, we hired. And there wasn't very many. So what I learned was like, for me, it was an like extremely hard, like culture shock almost coming into the chef driven hospitality world from being an automotive mechanic. A mechanic, you know, five o'clock rolls around, it's time to go. Like I can put my wrenches down. Doesn't matter if that project's done or not. They're probably in a rental car, but blah, blah, whatever. All my work stays there. And I come home and I go back 7.30 in the morning the next day and then I pick up left off. There wasn't a whole lot of ownership. Like I had ownership in the sense that like, I'm going to fix this person's car so that it's safe for them. No one else is going to touch that project. There was not going to be any other mechanic that was going to come in and work on that car. So going to a restaurant, understanding that like, I was working a station that I had to have ownership of and care for it as if it was my own and my own restaurant and set it up in a manner that when I'm not there, someone's going to come in and do that exact same thing on that station as well. And making sure that whoever's coming in behind me is you know, set up and I'm not leaving them in the weeds or with booby traps to find mid-service. So there was a sense of teamwork that I had to learn. And like I said, a sense of standards, like I didn't know most food at all going into that world. You know, working at a Chipotle where a lot of things come in bags, you know, that you're just opening up your heating or it's very, very simple, like cutting peppers and just quickly sauteing them. I was never cutting blocks of whole wheeled cheeses and wrapping them back up and storing. Like, I didn't know how to do any of that. So, like, I might do something with the confidence, like, I did this. And then, you know, Bill would find it like, what the fuck is this? What are you doing? You know, I'm like, I don't know. You know, and every day I was just getting pounded with something that I I was learning. I just didn't know and uh, kept my head down. Yes, chef, next project kind of thing. And just learning that the sense of urgency that comes in a kitchen, like that's, I'd never had that before. It was more about the culture. I think that shocked me the most in a good way. Like I loved it. Once I got there, I just didn't, didn't understand how my actions were going to affect everyone else in a kitchen. And if I wasn't pulling my weight, it meant that everyone had a lot more weight to pull. I'd, I'd, I'd never experienced that before. I didn't have to manage a ton of people until I got into bigger restaurants, which was another set of learning skills. But Sage was really good for me where I was coming out of culinary school. And, and like I said, not having been in the restaurant world ever. It's a lot of things, as I'm sure you've learned doing podcasts, a bunch of other chefs, like kind of have our own language and lingo when you're talking in the kitchen. I didn't know any of that. A lot of things was foreign language to me when I came into the kitchen. Bill Glover was on this podcast a couple months ago. Give me your best Bill Glover story from your time working with him. My best Bill Glover story. I love Bill. I think he was probably learning just as much about running a business as I was learning about trying to be a cook at that time. He was a really good friend. You know, like those were the first times too that I worked for someone that was a boss that was also like at the time a really good friend. Again, in the automotive world, the dudes I was working next to at five o'clock, we all got in our cars and went our separate directions. And when I got into the hospitality world, we all got done doing our thing. Most of the time, we probably went out and had beers afterwards, or you went to someone's house and, and hung out or played video games. Not to mention, you just spent 12 hours with that person in a six foot hot box dancing around. Like you get to know him really well. And um, so, Bill was a good friend of, of mine when, when I was there. So, still is. I just obviously not as close with him anymore as I haven't worked with him in a long time, but he did help do my food at my wedding and stuff like that. So, I have nothing bad to say, but trying to rack through my brain of stories that could be. Bill winds up getting the opportunity over at the Hilton to open a restaurant there. He's doing both Sage and the Hilton for a little while. Eventually, Sage winds up closing down. From there, where do you go? Because eventually you make it up to Cleveland and you wind up at the Greenhouse Tavern, right? When Sage closed, another good friend of mine, Josh Kayser, he was kind of our mercenary guy when we were at Sage. Him and Bill had worked together in the past. And like I said, it was a really small crew. And if one of us, you know, Sage had the perfect schedule where we were closed Sunday evening and Mondays, everyone had those days off. It was really like, if basically if it was open, the crew was there and we all had the same days off. So in the event that someone needed a day off, Josh was the person that we called in to plug and play. Josh had been doing kitchen work way longer than I had. And he can 
you could walk on any station and, and hold it down. And me and Josh had become good friends out of that, uh, working together at Sage. So when when things were looking rough at the end of Sage, you know, I was talking with Josh about what I should do. At that time, he was the executive chef at Bel Lago, which was this fish house up on up in Westerville, up on Hoover Lake. Again, I don't think it's there anymore, but he was up there and was like, well, whatever happens, happens. If you're looking for a job, I need help. Let me know. I went straight from Sage to, to Bel Lago with Josh. And that's the first time where I really had to manage a big team of people. And we also went from what was a, a little 60 seat restaurant that would get busy and maybe do anywhere between 40 and hundred covers to a restaurant that, you know, we would do anywhere from three to 400 covers on a, on a nightly basis. So a lot different, had learned some managing skills of other people and all that kind of stuff, but that was short lived. I was only there for probably, I think less than a year, probably six to eight months before I went to Cleveland and got the job at Greenhouse Tavern. At that time, the Greenhouse Tavern was either coming off the James Beard Award or about to that Sawyer takes home in 2008. How did you link up with them? Did you go and apply? Did you know somebody that was already there and kind of referred you in? They had, had not got that yet. He had been nominated before, so and he had his vinegar company. And obviously, I think Greenhouse started maybe the same year or right around when Sage did. So, you know, we're four or five years into this. Sawyer's making big waves in Cleveland and the, the Ohio food scene. So when Sage closed, I said, I went to Bel Lago. The other guy that was there, I, I, you know, I always say like there it was me and another dude. The other dude that was in Sage, was, his name is Ryan Beck, and he's m- my best friend to this day. He went to Bel Lago with me for a very brief time, just kind of for that paycheck. He moved to Cleveland and got a job at Greenhouse Tavern. Um, so he was already up there and he was working you, me and him staying in touch, being friends, basically telling him that like, I'm, you know, I'm not married to Columbus. I didn't grow up in Columbus. I grew up about an hour south of here. So it's not like it's very far away from home, but there's nothing in Columbus that's like keeping me in Columbus. At that time I wasn't married or anything like that. And also not to be offensive to anyone that was cooking in town at that time, like there really wasn't any restaurants in town that I, I wanted to go work at. What was our top 10 at that time, which I don't, I don't remember, but like looking at that, I'm like, eh, I don't really want to go to Rigsby's or go to you know, Veritas or anything like, again, it wasn't anything against those guys. Just it's not what I wanted to do. Just in that conversation of talking with my friend, he's like, well, if you ever want to move to Cleveland, he's like, we always need people up here and I could easily get you an interview. I said, I wasn't married at that time, but I was definitely living with a very serious girlfriend who is now my wife at that time. And, and I talked to Nikki about it and was like, what, what do you think about me possibly getting a job in Cleveland? And it'd be a good career move for me and blah, 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 blah. I think she had been to Cleveland maybe one time or maybe not at all. And she was 100% supportive of it. And she always has been. She came from the restaurant industry as well. So she she knew what I was doing. And she knew it would be a big move for me to get a place like that on my resume this this early on. So finally got an interview there after a couple emails back and forth uh, with the chefs up there. You know, it wasn't Sawyer. Sawyer I mean, he has multiple restaurants and a big crew. So it wasn't, it wasn't like I was talking to Jonathan Sawyer setting this up. But the crew that was there running those restaurants... I finally got a working interview, a stage again, just like how I got in the stage. So it wasn't mystery basket. It was just come work for a couple hours. Let us see what you can do. Prior to that, when me and the wife's talking about this, we got up one Tuesday afternoon and was like, hey, what do you want to do today? And, and just on a whim, we're like, let's drive to Cleveland and see what it's like. Just for shits, let's the city of Cleveland is all about. I had only been there twice in my whole life and it was for concerts, like drive straight to the House of Blues, go to a concert and get in the car and drive back home. So I, I didn't know anything about it either. And uh, we drove straight into the heart of Lakewood, which reminded us very much of Clintonville at the time. We drove around, like had good vibes from it. The houses were kind of cute. We saw a couple for rent, just randomly popped in on them and, you know, to see how much they were versus what we were paying in town, all that kind of stuff. I think we looked at two apartments while we were there. One of the apartments was just a real nice little duplex that like would have fit us perfect. And the, and the price was, I think the guy charges like 600 bucks a month for this apartment, which was way cheaper than what we were paying where we were in Clintonville. Was like, well, well hang on a second. He's like, so you guys have never been to Cleveland. Neither one of you have jobs in Cleveland. You want to take over my apartment? And I'm like, yep. And he like stood there for a second. He's like, well, I, I was like, I got a job interview lined up. And he's like, oh yeah, where at? And I told him it was Greenhouse Tavern. He was like, oh, great restaurant. You guys seem like really good people and just like handed the lease to us. And he's like, you should sign this before I change my mind. We signed it right there on the front porch. And like first time in Cleveland with Nikki, we, we left residents of Cleveland. And then two weeks later, I had my working interview at Greenhouse Tavern and, and got the job, got moved up there, started work pretty much immediately. And at that time, Greenhouse was, and they had Noodle Cat and they were in the process of opening up Trentina. It was 
like at my year and a half mark at Greenhouse when Sawyer won the James Beard Award. It was a really cool experience in that whole saga. Up to that point, you had done fermentation on your own a little bit before, but was this your first time doing it in a restaurant setting? Yeah, I think so. You know, I didn't know much about fermentation. Like I was just starting to play around with it when I got to Greenhouse, like making sauerkraut at home. Uh, you know, a couple failed batches of just this and that. And like, I still didn't really know a ton about it. Like I didn't trust myself that I was just going to put salt on these vegetables and leave them sit at room temperature. And it was going to be safe to eat. Like I had to read a few textbooks to, to convince myself that this is how it happens. And also a lot of restaurants don't love it when you just willy nilly take some vegetables and set them around and maybe they come out good and maybe they don't. But Greenhouse was the first place that I really empowered the chefs there to like make good food, make unique food, make things that people have never seen before. And like, we didn't really worry about the mistakes that was happening at Greenhouse at that time. Like, I don't want to say money wasn't an object because obviously it was at some point because it's not there anymore, but that wasn't the conversations we were having to, to make, to make food on a daily basis in that, in that kitchen. So, and it helped the other people around me in that kitchen were also interested in those same things. And I use, I'll use the reference, another good friend of mine that I don't know that you've talked to, but you've probably heard his name, Jeremy Umansky in Cleveland, who now runs Larder. He's like the, the Koji guru of the world. Like he's really big in the fermentation world. Like me and him started Greenhouse on the same day. Like we were there staging together. Like we started the same day. So like I had folks like him that I was rubbing elbows with every day. That was really, really cool. Like seeing tech fermentation techniques and foraging techniques that I'd never, never seen before. A lot of things with food and cooking is just about trying it. Try something, fuck it up. If it doesn't taste good, so what? Throw it in a trash can, start over. And a lot of fermentation was that way for me in the beginning as well. Whether it was fermentation or not, just like the food in general, the fact that I was now around, you know, I came from a world where I was around three other cooks all the time to a world that maybe I was around like five to 10 other cooks at a time. And then when I got to Greenhouse, I mean, you might have 20 to 30 cooks roll through there in a day's time to make both lunch and dinner services happen. And all of them were... When I got there, it wasn't like anyone was there for a job. People were there because they were, they wanted this on their resume. They wanted to be the next chef of that place, or they were in culinary school and they were doing their externship there. I mean, like everybody there was striving to be a chef and it was competitive and it was, you constantly got pushed by your peers in a good way. And we, you know, we had to have a special there every single day that consisted of some sort of offal meat, go to the fifth quarter. Anybody could do it. But if you wanted to have yours on there, you better get in there hours before your shift started so that you could get started on it or else someone was going to do that exact same thing and get ahead of you and you'd be left in the dust. Obviously, not you would never have something on the menu. So it was just a really cool experience to be able to, one, be around those folks that would push you, folks that you felt like were just as good as line cooks or chefs as you were or better and have the platform and your higher ups support you in it and be like, yep, continue doing what you're doing and, and put out cool, unique food. Next, you wind up at the Black Pig with Michael Nowak, who was the owner, original executive chef. I think there've only ever been something like four or five other executive chefs during the time it was open. You, Michael, obviously, Adam Lambert, David Kokab too. How did you wind up there? Yeah, it was like maybe just a little over two years. Honestly, when we got into town, uh, when we moved to Cleveland, I obviously had the job at Greenhouse. My wife was looking for a job and, uh, she was still in the hospitality world at that time. So she was looking at other restaurants and she ended up getting a job at Greenhouse as well, or within the Sawyer network. But one of the first places she interviewed was Black Pig with Mike. So because of that, he knew me like the linear, you know, the story was like, we're moving up here because my husband's got a job at Greenhouse Tavern. So like right off the rip, I got introduced to Mike. Mike and Sawyer used to work together back in the day. I think Mike was Sawyer's sous chef back at Barcento when it first when Sawyer came back from New York and Cleveland, I had, I feel like I had a good amount of respect with Mike right off the rip. So over the course of the couple of years that we were there, you know, we had been in the black pig to eat a couple of times, both when it was on 25th street and then it moved over onto 28th and corner of 20th and bridge. So it was a little bit different vibe in both spots. Like, so I had eaten at both establishments, both dinner and, and brunch. And, you know, when I was leaving Greenhouse, the reason I was leaving Greenhouse is I just, I wanted to change what I was doing. Greenhouse was very high volume. A Cavs game would come in, you know, we would do 300 covers before the Cavs game would start. And it's only seven o'clock and we still have the rest of the night to go. So when you're moving that much volume, you have to make some decisions in the moment that you're not always proud of. It could be something as simple as French fries. Like I've got these 10 orders of French fries in the window. Could they be crispier? Yes. 
but if I refire them, these 10 people are going to be late for the game. You know, so it's like, do I make them late for the game and get bad reviews and have terrible service upstairs or have the server get their head ripped off? Or do I just sell this food that's passable, but in, in my set of standards, I don't want to. And like, I just found myself having to do that too much for my comfort. Um, so I wanted to move back to a smaller now that I had felt like I had kind of been around a big group of people, I knew myself I had chops but as any of those other line cooks. I wanted to move back into a smaller setting restaurant that I could truly put my thumbprint on every plate that was leaving the kitchen and just have more control. And, and not that I wasn't proud of the food that we were putting out at Greenhouse, but I, I just wanted to slow it down and pay more attention to the things that mattered to me. I just cold called Mike, sent him my resume and basically just told him we weren't staying in Cleveland permanently. We knew we had about another year and a half to two years at most in Cleveland before we moved back to Columbus. So I just told him like, here's my experience. Here's my timeline. Here is what I need to make. And basically I just told Mike, you know, something I should, what I should have said was all those times I went to eat at Black Pig, what I admired about the Black Pig is Mike was in his business running it and working it. There was days where I walked in where he was the host. There was days where I'd walk in and he was helping behind the bar. I seen him run food. I'd seen him cook. Like he, no matter what needed done, he was in there doing it. And that's something that I really admired. And I, I wanted to be back with someone that had a, a grasp on what was happening in the setting. Nothing negative towards Greenhouse. It was just, I wanted to learn that side of it. At Greenhouse, I was learning how to run a kitchen. I was learning how to make food. I was learning how to put out these huge numbers. I wasn't really learning how to run a and that's exactly what Mike was doing, running a small business in every aspect possible. I respected that. And I told him that. And I was like, so if you've got a spot for me, great. I'm not looking to climb the ranks here. Like, I don't start me somewhere and think that I'm going to end up here. Like, tell me what you need done, plug me there, and I'll do it. And, that, and I did that. That was great. Like, I came on board pretty much immediately at the Black Pig. And I had a great time while I was there. I was just talking to my wife about that last night, actually, that my mindset leaving Greenhouse, because I had just come off of these high volume and being around all these really good cooks, like going back into a setting where it was only going to be three or four of us working in a kitchen all day again. It was good. It was refreshing. It was felt like my mindset was the best that it had ever been walking into a new job and just like, all right, here's what you guys do. You already do it great. I'm going to find some ways to make it better and tighten it up and, and do whatever Mike needs done. A lot of good friendships came out of that rest, all those restaurants. But I really liked my time I spent at, at Black Pig. All those dudes that were there in before and after me, like Adam Lambert, you know, he got to pop back in a few times. I got to know Adam fairly well. And Dave Kocab, who was there after me, Dave was my grill guy at Greenhouse. Like I trained Dave on, on grill. So me and Dave went, went back. Dave's one of my really good friends to this point. And leaving Black Pig, I, I told Mike, I was like, hey, if you want to replace me, there's two people in this in this city that I would reference to, or I'd be, I'll send to you. And Dave was one of them. And my buddy Ryan, who I mentioned was that sage with me, was the other one. But eventually Dave landed that probably eight months to a year after I left the Black Pig. Dave was there. Super fun little restaurant. Really excited that I got to work there. I love how they closed out. So often there's times where restaurants close for you never know the reason. You just, Even if you work there, you may not know the reason. You show up one day, the doors are locked. You know, there's a walkout or this was just a, a true story. Like, hey, like we've did this. We've done our thing here. Next chapter, like we're moving away. We want to go do this somewhere else. And they had a whole like closing week. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it was April of 2021. You did a five to six course tasting menu. Everybody cooked one of the courses. Yeah, it was great. Quite an experience like to be able to cook with all those dudes again. Like I mentioned, this is an industry of instant gratification. Like you get to make something and instantly see someone's reaction when you hand them that plate. Normally in an average restaurant setting, usually everybody that's in your restaurant on a nightly basis is excited to be there or happy that they're there and excited that they got food. But there's a large amount of people that are just there because their party's there or because it's the restaurants close to their house or, and they don't really care. Like, But those nights, closing out the Black Pig with those guys, every person was there, was there to see us and was there because they were like, this is the last time I ever get to experience this. And it was walking out into the dining room. Each of those nights, we did like two seatings, if I remember correctly. So we did like 25 people and then another 25 people. And like every time we would go into the dining room, we would get a round of applause and people were just so excited to see us. And that was like, man, like what a great way to close off such a good chapter. Like I said, it, it sucks when you see a restaurant that you love just close up and you have no reason why. But like what a cool send off for some really good folks. To this day, one of my highest memorable weekends of my career that I'm so glad I got to take part. While you're there, you get named Rising Star Chef by Cleveland Scene, which is a local magazine publication up there in the Cleveland area. When you get a local award like that, how much 
does that mean to you personally as a chef who's working through the industry, but then also the restaurant? Does it depend on the size of the restaurant in terms of how much it makes a difference? Or is it just one of those awards where, you know, it's nice to be honored, nice to be recognized, but never really makes too much of an impact? I don't know the best way to answer that, honestly. Like, what well, I definitely was named Rising Star. That kind of came at the same time and probably and because of maybe I was accepted as one of Sam Pellegrino's top 10 young chefs for this competition. Yeah. So I think those kind of came like hand in hand. And honestly, I, you know, I don't know why. Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's because of the size of the restaurant. I don't know if going from the greenhouse down to, to Black Pig and like being able to put my thumbprint on things. Like, I'm, I'm not sure where the attention was to me in that sense, because in all those scenarios, like never me going out into the dining room, still talking to folks. I mean, every now and then it would be, it's still Mike's restaurant in a greenhouse. It's still Sawyer's restaurant. And like, if, if there's publications to be had about those, like those guys are there out in the dining rooms to be talking about their restaurants. So, you know, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure where the, when the attention got drawn my way, but I'm thankful that it did. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't have happened without those two establishments in my life of greenhouse and, and black pig and, and the connections that I'm sure that those places already had with the people of that city. You know, I think about like the Doug Tratners of the world, who is, uh, I don't want to call him a critic, but he, he writes in Cleveland and he's done, I think he's done some Simon's books and he's usually the guy that puts out food reviews for, I don't know if it's Cleveland scene or not, but he's a Cleveland food writer is, is what's more important. And he's a really reputable Cleveland food writer. And he definitely frequented those restaurants. I mean, it wasn't until later in life that I met Doug on a personal level, but I'm hoping that it's folks like him that knowledge on how a restaurant works and recognize that the people that's back there grinding is a lot of times what's happening. The people that's making the food for you, or you're making the experience happen for you. It was cool to have that, you know, as far as like, did I, I don't know that I necessarily seen any turnaround, like being named rising star by uh, a Cleveland publication. Like I'm sure it made the restaurant a, a touch busier on, you know, maybe it brought in a couple people, but it wasn't like when Sawyer won the James Beard award, like it was literally like when that happened, it was like, there was a light switch on the wall that said busy and turned it on. It was really busy. And like, it was just instantly like, I didn't know we could be any busier. And all of a sudden there was more people, but it was, it's cool. Like I've been really lucky and thankful for the press and media attention I've gotten over the years, because I definitely didn't go out and seek it. I, I, I don't, not really good at like selling myself, I'm not a person that's writing stories and pitching it to, you know, media outlets to, to showcase myself. So I'm really lucky that all that stuff kind of fell into me organically. I think I got my first little like 30 second live news interview when I was at Black Pig and I was, I was, I was like on cloud nine for like three days. I'm like, I was on the fucking news this morning. And now like, God, I got to do a news interview again. Like that stuff. Some people, you know, care about it and some people don't care about it at all. And at that time in my career, it was like super cool to have some attention of, of some local press and. What was the format for the San Pellegrino Young Chef competition that you cooked in? Bill, when he was on the podcast, talked about cooking for the James Beard House and how he was on the hook for getting out there and the cost of all the ingredients and everything. Was it similar in a situation to that? Or was it kind of a, this is a competition you can come and participate in and they provided everything? I stumbled across it. I think it was like the second or third year they were doing it. There was a handful of regulations. You had to be like 30 or under and blah, 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 blah. So I, I met the the criteria for that young chef category. And the way you entered it was you had to enter a enter a recipe of your signature dish, photos of it. I think that was it. Yeah. You just had to submit a recipe and, and photos. And I did that months ago, you know, sent it off in an email and it was just vanished out into the world forever. I didn't, again, at that point in time, I didn't really know what the, I didn't look too much into it, what the competition was after that or how the narrowing down of it was or what other types of people might be in this competition. But yeah, one day, uh, months after I submitted all that, uh, I got an email that was like, you know, congratulations, you've been nominated as one of the semifinalists to move on to the to the next round of competition. And it's like, you've been, you know, whittled down from however many thousands of applicants. And then I opened up the email to see who else moved on to realize that it was only 10 people and we, the 10 of us were going to compete amongst ourselves to, in the winner of that, be the, the person who would represent the U.S. and go to the, the world competition to where it was literally just like the U.S. versus every other country that's there. And I'm looking at some of the other names that are on, the, on this sheet. And, you know, it's like none of them are. It's all rising star folks, you know, so they're sous chefs and, and CDCs. It's not necessarily like owner operators of these restaurants, but I mean, there's all these guys that are coming out of places that are either Michelin starred or James Beard award restaurants. And I'm like, 
I've never even fucking eaten at a Michelin starred restaurant, let alone like rub elbows with this, like this dude's from Manresa. Like I, I nerd out in their cookbook. I mean, you know, so I'm just like a hillbilly that's learned how to cook a little bit. So that was like really cool. Very exciting. Again, one of those like moments that confidence boosts, like it's hard to realize how good you are until you're around other people doing the same things. Being a sage, you're one of three people. You might be the best person that could be doing that job, but you don't know that because you don't compare yourself to anyone else that's doing that job. You're, you're, you're the only person they're doing. That was a really cool, like I said, confidence booster for me to be like, hey, like I'm just because I'm at a little restaurant in Cleveland that maybe some folks haven't heard of doesn't mean I'm any different or less than the guys that are at these Michelin starred restaurants. And that was super cool. So once I got accepted to that, I had to fly to New York to do that competition. Everything was paid for. Like they took me there. The only thing they didn't pay for was my wife's plane ticket to get there. I was lucky enough that someone along the way, um, I think it might've been my oldest brother actually was just like, Hey, I'm proud of you. Like whatever money you got to spend on this, I, w- I want to spend it on you. And I was like, well, actually, I think everything's covered except for my wife's ticket. And he's like, I'll buy it. I had to front like the food stuff up front. Like I had to buy, I had to take my ingredients with me. All that got reimbursed though. So I fly into New York. I have that night there to just kind of relax. We go in the next day for the actual competition. Actually, I say we had a night to relax. They took us all out to dinner at a really nice restaurant in New York. It was, I'm not going to remember the name of it at this point, a Michelin starred restaurant. So there was my first time being able to eat Michelin starred food amongst Michelin starred chefs that I was going to compete with. We had dinner the one night. And then the competition was the next night. Competition was, uh, we had six hours to pull it off and it was staggered. So basically someone would start and then about an hour later, someone else would start an hour later, someone else would start in your last hour of finishing up when you should be like plating, you had to make, I think like eight plates of food. There was three judges while you were doing that. There was a film crew in the kitchen filming you. So where you took your food out to see the judges, there was a 60 person audience that was eating the same food. So this San Pellegrino had an entire kitchen that was just putting out bite-sized portions of your recipe. So once I got accepted to that competition, then my homework started. Like you got to bring all your own food. And also you need to scale your recipe up to feed 60 people, but you don't have to cook it. You have to submit it to a chef who's going to interpret your recipe, make this dish and feed the 60 people that are coming to watch your competition. So it was really cool. So like, as I'm in the kitchen, like plating my food, a sample of my dish is being dropped off to the audience that's watching the judges judge me in just a few minutes. Really, really cool experience. Really cool networking opportunity for me to rub elbows with some guys that, you know, from coast to coast uh, were in this room that I normally wouldn't have got to meet. I didn't win that competition, but just the fact that I made it as far as I did was already a huge win. When that happened, I feel like just I got more attention from the the local media. And that's like the perfect segue into the next step. Like I had that rising star from the Cleveland publication. I was at Black Big. I just come from Greenhouse where they had just won an award. I was nominated for the San Pellegrino thing. And while I was nominated for the San Pellegrino thing, like as I was waiting to go to New York in July, Watershed was beating on my door about possibly coming and running their program. Again, I think a lot of that boils back to like, I had a lot of press following me around at that, like local press, but, and at that point, my wife now had now worked for Watershed in Cleveland. So I had a little bit of knowledge that there was a restaurant opening with them. Everything was contingent upon some bill that had to pass through the Ohio government, basically allowing distilleries to be on the same playing field as brew pubs and wineries with how much alcohol they could produce and serve to somebody. Was all that passed before the opportunity with Watershed or was the restaurant contingent upon all that going through like, hey, we want to do this, but if this doesn't happen, this doesn't pass, we're not going to be able to do it. You're right on that. And I don't know the exact details of what it was, but basically distilleries couldn't operate as brew pubs and wineries could. You couldn't sell your own product on site kind of thing. Dave and Greg, the owners of Watershed at the time, were big into finding the loophole in that bill so they could do that. And, and you know, they were the ones I think were doing a lot of the lobbying or finding lobbyists to, to go to the state house and stuff and, and talk about this and, and get this loophole written or changed so that they could operate like those brew pubs. So by the time they were approaching me, I'm not 100% sure if it had was 100% passed yet, or if it, I think it was at least to the point and they knew enough people that was involved that they felt very, very, very comfortable that this was, this was going to pass. They definitely had wheels in motion by the time they were talking to me. 
So I don't remember that exact timeline though, if it had passed yet or not, or if it was a, something as simple as like, yep, it's passed and then effective on this date kind of thing. But as soon as they got the okay, Dave and Greg definitely hit the ground running and, and wanted the restaurant to happen as quickly as possible. We wanted to be the state's first distillery restaurant combo to be open. Once everything is in motion and you agree to join the restaurant, how difficult is it to come up with a new menu from scratch? It's a brand new concept at that point. Nobody had a distillery restaurant, you know, either before in Ohio. So everything is brand new. It's a new category, a new menu. How difficult, how challenging is that? I mean, very challenging. To say that it wasn't uh, would be a lie, but to say that it was challenging in that moment, I, you know, I don't remember it being challenging in the moment. Not the menu part of it anyway. Like it, it is challenging for me to write a menu, but writing that initial menu at that point in time, you know, that was 2016 cooking for seven, eight years, you know, almost 10 years at that point. So I had a catalog of things in my head that I was like proud of that. I'm like, I know this flavor profile works. I know people enjoy deep fried Brussels sprouts. Like there, there's some things that I had lined up for the initial start. It wasn't, I don't feel like it was hard. You know, like the, the hard thing was, was like the moving with the timeline truly just getting everything built out and like plugging systems in. Okay. Like dirty glasses, they go here to dish tank here to, to polishing area here. Like that's what was very challenging because uh, I never set those systems up before. I always walked into a restaurant that was already operating. This is the system that we're using for whatever project you're working on. Setting up these blind systems without seeing a, a, something that's actually functioning was challenging. And I think me and Andrew, the general manager who opened with us and Alex, the bar manager who was opening, I think we all like those first three months was the most challenging because just like, oh, well, we thought it was going to operate this way and it clearly is not going to. So we need to rewrite that system with a hurry and, and change. And like the glassware was something that I, I constantly think about because when we first started, all the glassware had to come into the kitchen. And that was because that was where the dish machine was. We didn't have a special machine just for the glassware. And we realized how much glassware we were actually running and how much volume we were doing and the breakage that would happen in the kitchen. And the list goes on on why we needed to do it somewhere else and, and to be more efficient. You know, month three, we're getting a different dish machine installed so that the servers can have a whole area that's not in the kitchen to polish and all that kind of stuff. So it's those types of things that are really hard to see when the restaurant's not running, at literally seeing the people inside of it. But the initial open, you know, it was fun. I'd never had a chance to like completely design a kitchen. Not that I had like total hands on that, but like just seeing the whole process from inspection, you can see inspections, getting the hood installed and all that kind of stuff. Like when I toured Watershed the first time as a, hey, this is going to be our restaurant. It is literally a dusty concrete hole that used to be warehouse space. That was in like July. And by December was a restaurant space. Uh, you know, it was totally different. It, it was a very fast project. Once we got it all up and running, though, you know, as far as like the food goes and the menu goes, I didn't put too much food on the menu after that. I, I put my thumbprint on it, but I've always been a firm believer that, you know, happy cooks make happy food, which make happy customers. And I, when I say that, you know, just because I wrote the menu and just because I want something to go this way doesn't mean that the person that's actually cooking it, because by that point, running Watershed, like I'm not the guy cooking your food. I'm the guy steering the ship inside the kitchen. Someone else is cooking the food and that person cooking the food. If you want it to look the way that I want it to look on the plate, he needs to be proud of putting that on the plate. He needs to be having a good time. He needs to be happy about that food, especially when in a high volume, like the 30th short rib you put on a plate that night. I want it to look like the first one tomorrow and the next day and the next day, we're going to put at minimum 30 more of those on the same plate. And if that person doesn't enjoy that or doesn't think that plate of food is good, they're not going to care about what it looks like on that plate. They're not going to take the extra steps. They're not going to have a set of standards around like, hey, this is this is perfect. I learned really early on, if you allow someone to have ownership of what's coming off of their station and they came up with some of those dishes or they came up with an ingredient they wanted to work with, much easier to control the food that's coming out and the creative levelness of it too. I mean, when you have someone that's excited to come to work for something that their thumbprint's on and that's on the menu, I much rather would take that and help that person make that dish perfect as opposed to like pound them into the head on like why my dish is perfect and I want it this way. So I got really lucky with that. And like we had a really good team when we opened up Watershed. We always had a really good team with Watershed. And you don't always have people coming through that want that type of responsibility. Don't get me wrong. Like there's definitely cooks that show up. It's like, nope, I'm here to run a station. I just want to learn, blah, 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 blah. I was lucky enough to have a, a really good group of guys and girls come through there in the beginning that were eager to learn and eager to put food on a plate, just like it was when I got to greenhouse. I mean, there's, it was competitive. People wanted to show their chops off a little bit. I, I gave them the opportunity to do that. It makes my job easier. I don't have to rewrite the menu. I got to focus on 
setting up these systems that don't work that we thought would. In the meantime, the food's going to stay fresh because my guys were excited about putting it out. One of the things you touched on was if your cooks had a great idea, a great dish, you'd let them put that on the menu. Not a lot of restaurants do that, at least that I know of. In your view, does that dish belong to them, the individual, or does that dish belong to the restaurant? Normally, that dish belongs to the restaurant, but that seems to be changing a little bit in the industry from at least what I can tell. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's food, man. It's all shit in 24 hours. Why get lost in that? I get it. I understand it. The issue is there's, it's so easy to, I guess, plagiarize for lack of a better term, someone's food these days. Like you can look at a cookbook, you know, a gorgeous cookbook and follow the recipe. And here's a picture that to, shows you how to plate it. And someone can do that in a restaurant setting, setting and replicate it and then sell that dish. And in, in what you're in chance, you know, what your intern is doing is selling someone else's idea and making money off of it. I get it why that's wrong. But at the same time, it's food. I don't think there's too many people out there that's creating new things with food. And I'm not saying that someone cooking something out of a cookbook and putting it on their restaurant menu is right by any means. It's not. But there has to be a level. Someone like me who learns that way, like I'm not ever going to go to Manresa and cook in their kitchen, but I can make recipes out of their book and understand what they did in this recipe or understand the flavor profiles and use that on an interpretation of my own food to spin it and make it my own. Like you have to learn from somewhere. Sometimes you learn something that doesn't need change. It's good. Like if that's the case, then you just got to give the person credit. And you know, I think that's that's something that I learned when I was at Greenhouse was like, hey, if something's great and just make sure you give credit where credit is due. And I, I say that. And if I, if I remember correctly, when I first got to Greenhouse, we had fried chicken on the menu and it was called TK's Fried Chicken. I never knew what the TK stood for. I couldn't figure out for a long time, like why there was TK in front of our fried chicken on the menu. And eventually I heard the story that it stood for Thomas Keller's fried chicken. And it was a story about how somebody had went and done a stage at this restaurant and saw the method that they used to make this fried chicken. And they adopted that. And that was their nod to like giving someone credit. Like it wasn't the same recipe. It was literally, we just took someone's technique of how they, of how they did this in a service. So, you know, the recipe was different. The seasoning was different. The way we played it, it was different, but there was a nod to, this is where this person learned this and you know, and we're taking it from them. That's a crazy world right now that I try to like dance. I I don't really walk on eggshells around it necessarily. I pay attention to it, but it bums me out when when people get caught up in in, in that side of food that like, oh, that's my idea or that's this culture or whatever. Like, man, it's just fucking food. Let's eat it and enjoy it. Laugh and drink around it. And like, that's, I I hate it when people try to take the ownership of it in that sense. But like I said, like, I I totally understand if someone's just straight ripping someone off. That's, I don't condone that. But there's, there's a fine line to not plagiarizing someone's food. But I'm all about, someone should work at as many restaurants as they should. You should read as many cookbooks as you should. You should replicate things that you love as many times as you could. Just don't call it yours if it's not yours. Give someone credit. You had a burger on the menu at Watershed since it opened. Columbus is a burger town. I think 95% of the restaurants in the city have a burger on the menu in some form or fashion. How hard is it to balance the familiar wants of your clientele where people want to have a burger, they want the burger on the menu, but at the same time, you want to push their boundaries and you also want to push the menu forward too as well. There's pigtail on the menu and you want to push people to try and something new and something they haven't experienced before. It's very hard. Honestly, it's, it's an ever evolving learning curve. That's always there. It's different in, in the cities that you go to. It's different with what's happening in the world. The, the diners that would come in pre-pandemic and the diners that come in now are different. It is definitely just, a, a, I don't say a struggle, but it's definitely never something that you just like, I don't feel like you ever just conquer it and understand like this is the balance. You always just have to be paying attention to what's what's selling, what's not. Burger is a very good representation of that. I knew if there was one thing I could change about the menu from the get goes, I'd take the fucking burger off because I didn't want a fucking burger on there. I cooked so many burgers when I was at Greenhouse. I didn't care if I ever saw one again. You know, when I started Greenhouse, I was the grill guy. I'd have the callbacks, you know, like how many burgers I have on pig? You know, there's like 25 burgers on pig. Come on. There's so much cooler shit on the menu. Order something else. You can get a burger anywhere. But that's easy to have that mindset as a line cook. It's easy to have that mindset as a, as a managing position in a restaurant when you don't have an opportunity to see a PL or see the numbers. And, and until you understand what's happening in the dining room, you understand the people that are coming in to eat at your establishment, you have to give them what they want in some sense. I'm not saying you have to be everything to everyone, but you have to recognize that the burger of the world, if you have a menu full of things that are challenging, 
not all of your diners are people who want really challenging things. Maybe when you're a small, like 30, 40 seat restaurant, that's reservation only people are coming there because they're just wowed out of your mind every single time they come into your establishment, then maybe you can do that. But when you're an establishment, like what watershed is where we wanted it to be, you know, the local watering hole, you know, like we wanted you to come in there three or four times in the, a week, if you wanted to, and spend a couple bucks and get a burger and a drink. We didn't want it to be this like big over the top extravagant experience. Every time you come in. We were already the a destination restaurant. Like there's no foot traffic at Watershed. So like, every, which is cool because every person that comes there has made it a conscious decision to, to drive and park there. They didn't just stumble across. But that means that you have to be out in front of like telling people you're there. You're not, you can't rely on any type of foot traffic. And in, in a company to that, I didn't want to be the occasion restaurant. Like if you're a destination and the occasion restaurant, it's almost like shooting yourself in the foot because then all of a sudden, not only you don't have that, you know, the constant influx of new customers coming to you from foot traffic, but also now people think that I can only come here on my anniversary or the birthday or whenever I'm going to spend, you know, top dollar on something or or this crazy experience that I'm going to talk about or crazy food that I had. A big high volume restaurant can't solely operate off of the people that only want to have the crazy shit that's floating around in my head. You have to be able to, the person that comes in that doesn't know Chef Jack Moore, that doesn't really know Watershed, they just Hey, we live in the apartments down the road. You got a bar, you got a menu. That's about as far as they want the conversation to go. And when they see that, when on those menus, they have to find something that they know and is approachable. That's where the burger is. <laughs> With that, we tried to take those items like the burger and make them as fun, as playful as possible, putting some maybe some challenging ex- flavors on it, or you know, maybe bringing something from the past or someone that maybe... I'm trying to think of here, like, like the rodeo burger from Burger King that, you know, the old burger that had the onion rings and barbecue sauce on it. We had a burger like that watershed. It had crispy fried shallots and a house made steak sauce on it. And like to read it on the menu, you're not going to think rodeo burger. But the second that someone was like, "Ah, I don't know if I you know, want this or this or that, like there's a really easy tool for me to plug with my servers. Like if someone's questioning what's happening on the burger, ask them if they ever have a rodeo burger from Burger King. Like they're going to be like, oh yeah, like those classic flavor profiles. It's definitely a, a really delicate dance finding that balance of things on the menu that people want to eat, will eat, and expect you to have when they get there. And unfortunately, you can't just, like I said, you can't just say no to it as much as I want to take a burger off. like, And, and I, I can't speak now because I'm not there, obviously. But if you pulled any of my numbers from those first couple of years of Watershed, outside of maybe the the short rib, because it's a braised short rib, and I don't care what verbiage you put around braised short rib on the menu, it's like always your number one seller. It doesn't matter what's there. It's just... Columbus, Ohio. It's like, oh, great short rib, braised meat. Past that, I'd say the number one seller is always the burger. It's an easy, comforting thing. I even have friends come from very few, but a couple of people from that I went to high school with would come to my restaurant. You know, and maybe I'd kept in touch with them or haven't, but I, like, I'm really cool. This is exciting. Like, I know what kind of environment you grew up in. It was very sheltered. Like, we probably ate the same growing up. So I'm really excited to like show people the food that's outside of the little country town we grew up in. And those are always the people that get the burgers. And I'm like, come on, try like, you know me, I wouldn't have anything on my menu that wouldn't be good. Like try something else. Yeah. It's you will always, especially in a, I don't say in a bigger town, I guess it's any town. You're always going to have to give people a little bit of what they want. If you want them to continue to come back to your establishment. And I definitely learned that. I don't know when, but like I got to a point where I'd have to, you know, I'd be telling cooks like, well, I don't want to do this on a, on a dish, or I don't want to do that on the menu, or I don't want to add this for whatever reason. I'm like, hey, as much as we want to cook for ourselves, we're not the ones sitting out in the dining room paying for it that keeps the bills on. So like the people that come in here, like if they want something, they want to give us money for something, then let's do our best to try to take their money from them and give them what they want. Once you open Watershed, I think the first year it was eligible, it's listed as number five on Columbus Monthly's 10 best restaurants list. Was there a contrast between how people viewed local awards in Cleveland versus how they viewed them here in Columbus? Was it the same where big deal to some does help a little for the restaurant? Yeah, I mean, big deal to some. I think it definitely helps when that list comes out. Every year when you're on the top 10 list and, and we started, we came out of the gate and seat five. And by the time I left, we had moved up to seat three on that list. You'll definitely have people come in just because that list came out, you know, like, oh, you're on the top 10 list. So that's, you know, people that those are their next 10 spots to go out to eat. Uh, we're going to try all of the, the best stuff. So I, I definitely feel like it does. That's the type of free press 
that you can get as a restaurant or hospitality group that that does generate some business for you. But I wouldn't say it generates enough business that is like, you know, you can't eliminate your marketing strategy because you got on the top 10 list in Columbus, Ohio. Like, and it's, you know, to me personally, like I was very proud coming out of the gate, hitting number five. You know, for me, this it was the first restaurant that I could like truly, like I was at the helm of. It was something that the owners of Watershed had like mentioned to me. Like we would like, it's not like it was going to get fired if I didn't have a top 10 restaurant, but you know, I'd heard it come out of their mouth. Like we would love we would love to have a top 10 restaurant in this town. I'm not saying that I ha- I had any idea or strategy of like, we're going to be on a top 10 list and this is how we're going to do it. But it's definitely in my mind all the time that we got to strive to be the best. We got to strive to be, we got to do things. We got to get people's attentions. We got to hit home runs all the time. I'm not necessarily saying that's the best mindset to always have because I definitely like, it's really easy to like kill yourself in a kitchen and work too much and kill your staff and all that kind of stuff. And then, you start paying attention to only that and only being on lists and only prestigious awards. uh, I think you can go in the wrong direction a little bit. It was really cool feeling for me to hit number five and it being my first restaurant coming back to a city where no one really had known me, like coming back to Columbus, nobody was writing about me in Columbus. You know what I mean? Like it's not that I was unheard of, but coming like all the press that me me and you just talked about the San Pellegrino stuff, the, the rising star, like, I was creating a name for myself in Cleveland. And then all of a sudden I was going to go to a much larger city that has way more restaurants. And it was really cool that to come out right at number five and to continue to move up in those, in those ranks. Like I was really proud of myself and and my team that made that happen. Knowing what you know now, would you still put an 18 ounce bacon steak on the menu today if you were opening a new restaurant? Probably because, you know, I'm not at Watershed anymore, like in the sense of working there, but I, I still do make hot sauce there. So I still get to see everyone in the mornings when I'm there. Like I was there this morning making hot sauce. And I still get, to, I'm still around when the restaurant meetings are happening. And like, it was literally just this week, one of the servers was telling me that somebody was asking if the baking steak was coming back. Surprisingly, people bought the hell out of that. We would always run out of that because we couldn't keep enough in stock. Um, it was a big item, a heavy prep item for us. So it was it was hard to keep around and it was also expensive. So I couldn't, we ran it as a special one day as just like something fun and different to do. I'm like, man, that sold really well. Let's, let's do it again. Then we actually got pressed because of it. It was on Burgers Brew and Q, Michael Simon's TV show. That kind of stuff is what, you know, you're talking about whether a top 10 list makes you busy. When a TV show like that airs or a rerun happens months later, like, you know it because all of a sudden, like right off the rip, the first 15 tickets, bacon steak, bacon steak, bacon steak, you know, and like, oh, like I'll just, I'll instantly just tell the grill guy, like a rerun must have aired. So like, go get your backup bacon steaks, go get the ribs out. Like you, you, you definitely see that. And honestly, knowing what I know now, uh, the only reason I took the bacon steak off the menu was because people didn't eat it the way I wanted them to. I originally made that dish as a lettuce cup taco dish. Here's this big old slab of meat. And I gave you a bunch of little lettuce cups and a bunch of pickles and different accoutrements, pork rinds to like cut up this big fatty piece of pork, put it in a lettuce cup, like build your own little like lettuce cup taco. In great Columbus, Ohio fashion, what happened 99% of the time is somebody would house the whole piece of bacon and not touch any of the vegetable stuff. Someone literally just sat out there and ate like a pack and a half of bacon. And that was it. Um, So I'm just like, man, like nothing that's, it's delicious bacon. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's not that people to do. I wanted you to like eat it with some of this other cool stuff we have. And eventually one day as I'm watching the dishwasher scrape off, you know, like a whole head of lettuce into the trash can with all of our pickles that we made. I'm like, fuck this. Like no one's eating it the way we want to. Anyway, we probably lose money on it because it's, it's more of a wow factor. You know, that was one of the cool things that I did in the beginning with watershed is like the first couple of years of watershed, we weren't really paying attention to like food costs and all that kind of stuff. Like I wanted to put things on the menu. I didn't want to lose money on them, but what I wanted to do was to create buzz. When someone was leaving there, I wanted them talking about the big, you know, double bone pork chop or the bacon steak. Like I wanted them telling people outside of watershed that they had this crazy shit that, that, that they're going to come back in for. And that definitely worked. Like to this day, if anyone talks about the pork chop they had at watershed, they're, they're like, did you see the size of that thing? It was great. You know, and like, did we make money on it? No, but we definitely made a lot of raving fans. I guarantee you there's a lot of conversations in people's households when they're talking about favorite restaurants in town, talk about the bacon steak or the pork chop. And not too many restaurants in the world, you can um, push your loss leaders like that. 
most restaurants don't even have a marketing budget, let alone a distillery attached to them that they're trying to, to do that. So there's definitely some things I would do differently knowing what I know now, but I'd probably still bring the bacon steak back if I had the opportunity just in a different way. Last fall, you announced that at the beginning of 2022, you'd be leaving Watershed after about five years running the, the restaurant since it first opened. How did you come to that conclusion that it was time to move on and start your own thing? Was it all COVID related? Yeah, a lot of it, honestly. I mean, it was um, COVID was, I had a lot of silver linings come out of the pandemic, honestly. Watershed knew I wasn't there forever, but I didn't have a timeline necessarily. So the hot sauce started, the hot sauce actually started in like 2018. And it was a conversation between me and my wife. How do I reach people that's not coming into the restaurant as a chef brand? You know, like how do people who don't come into Watershed still know me as Chef Jack and then be able to experience something that's mine? And I had this fascination with running small businesses. Like I've mentioned before, like on Black Pig, like I, I, I love the entrepreneur mindset. I always listen to a ton of like brand building podcasts and stuff like that. And it's just like, it amazes me how you can truly just like take a, a company any direction you want and, you know, put your moral values behind it. And I had this idea combined with that. I'm a fermentation nerd and I was a hot sauce nerd and all that kind of stuff. So like, we came up with this idea, like maybe we start a, a CPG company, you know, a consumer package good, like, hot sauce. Like let's, let's make something that someone could buy out in the store that has my name attached to it. It was just a total back burner project and more just like kind of having fun. I had been making hot sauce like since my greenhouse days and I'd like changed the recipe a little bit different at the Black Pig. And, you know, we made that hot sauce at Watershed. So it's just where the starting point was. Like it made sense. Like I had this recipe I'd been dialing in fairly close. It was everything that I wanted to put myself out there as, you know, a fermented product and everything that I wanted to be, it was that. Just literally needed to put it in a bottle. But at the same time, I was running Watershed and I didn't really have time to like develop a brand or develop a label and all that kind of stuff. But the network that was at Watershed, the creative branding agencies that we would work with or the graphic designer that was there, all these people that had worked with me building Watershed story knew my story better than anybody else, obviously, because they work hand in hand with me all the time. So it was really easy for me to go to that network of people and be like, hey, I got this idea. Can you help me put it on paper? Or, hey, I got, you know, here's this mood board to the graphic designer, can you help me create a label for this? And it was everybody's back burner project because I wasn't trying to spend a whole lot of money on it. And I was, like I said, trying to do something fun. So it was a really slow roll in like 2018. And I made a couple batches, gave it to people to try, which is where the whole like white cap, black cap thing came. There was two bottles that I gave, like, let's narrow this recipe down, made a batch that had a white cap on it. And I made a batch that had a black cap on it. And I gave it to totally random people just to see their feedback. And Black Cap was the winner. But all of that was just happening as the pandemic was starting. So a slow moving project that was like something that was already slow moving just ended along with everything else, you know, when, when the whole shutdown happened. And, you know, honestly, I didn't think about hot sauce too much more in the beginning of the pandemic. Like it was kind of everyone's in shock. Like we don't know when the restaurant's going to open back up. We don't know. You know, we're going to have to change concepts. It was just like such a learning curve in the beginning of the pandemic. And pretty early on, we made the decision to keep the restaurant at Watershed closed for the duration of, I don't want to say the duration of the pandemic. I don't want to sound like we're out of the pandemic. I, I'm fully aware that we're all still in this and there's still issues, but we're definitely a lot closer to what normal felt like before right now than we were, you know, say six months into it. I recognize that, hey, it's, it's really easy to lose money in a restaurant. It's really hard to make it. If the distillery didn't exist, then that restaurant didn't exist. So that day that the shutdown happened, the distillery also, not only did it lose its restaurant, it also lost a ton of business, all the restaurants that it would work with. So we felt it was the best option that let's, let's keep the money in the bank for the distillery to operate and figure out what it's got to do. Let's let the people who are, have been working hard in the restaurant, like let's keep them safe. Let them stay home. If they want to come in and work at the distillery, there's jobs for them here, but it wasn't a restaurant at that time that switched in the hand sanitizer mode and all that. So there was avenues for people to work. But ultimately, we wanted to keep our people safe and keep the money in the bank, reopen it when we felt it was a, a good time to reopen and safe time to open. So in that whole like year that we were closed, once I got to a point that I started realizing in during the pandemic that my life was a lot different now than it was when I was a 20-year-old line cook back at Sage. You know, I, I mentioned that like I engulfed myself in, in the hospitality world in, a, in an unhealthy manner. It's easy to do that when you're a single line cook and you don't have anything else. Like there's really nothing to lose. I didn't really need much money. I lived in the office at Sage for some of the time that I was there. Like I didn't have a car. I had no responsibility. All my responsibility was a restaurant. And that wasn't the case in the pandemic. In the pandemic, 
I now have a wife, a dog, cats, a house, things that I actually thoroughly enjoyed spending time with and being in and wanted to spend time more on. You know, I wanted to be able to do projects around my house and I want to be able to take my dog on walks when it's 70 degrees outside on a Saturday. And I want to be able to hang out with my wife who no longer works in the food industry anymore. That's, you know, doesn't want to stay up with me until four in the morning because she has to get up at seven and things were just a lot different. And, and the longer that I was experiencing the happiness of that, the thought of going back to just working was daunting. What I'm about to say now, I don't want it to be negative on Watershed. It, it wasn't for me. You know, like Watershed is not mine. I was just running the restaurant. I really had a moment during the pandemic where, I mean, I had a lot of moments during the pandemic, but in, in that specific moment, I was like, if I'm going to work this hard for something, then it should be mine. You know, like all the all the extra benefits that come out should be mine. And I don't know, I had to do some hard soul searching and and understand that like, the one thing I did understand was if I'm not happy, then I'm not doing anyone a service, a good service. You know, if I'm if I'm just going to work to work, I'm, I'm probably not putting my all into it. So the second that I recognize that, I, I have to be finding a path of like what's wrong or wh- what do I got to do next. And so like I understood that that was happening to me during the pandemic, and it just the pandemic really put perspectives back in line for me, like what was important. And running someone else's business is not at the top of my priority list anymore. And so I had to find a way to put some of the things in my back on top of my priority list, like being able to spend time with my family and my my new house that I bought when I moved back to Columbus to run Watershed that I don't spend more than 45 minutes in awake uh, because I'm at the restaurant every other time. I, I wanted to experience all that stuff. So as that was happening, maybe this is the perfect opportunity for the hot sauce to come truly come alive. Like if I could start something with this, this will give me an opportunity to just do exactly what I just said. All the extra time and effort I put into this is is ours. It's mine. Like every when I have to work a twelve hour day for hot sauce, the only person that reaped those benefits me. That's I guess kind of a shitty thing to say when you work in a capitalism environment, but like it's it's what I needed right now to understand that I was doing exactly what was right for me, my mental state, and and my career path forward. So basically was like, well, let's let's write out a rough plan on like what this looks like, what this looks like to get this product off the ground. At the same time, you know, I started conversations with with Watershed again to like let, let's get let's talk about how this is going to get back up and rolling. Coming back into that before I ever open the doors up again, like having conversations with Greg the owner, you know, I told him I was like, I don't, you know, we've always said this wasn't my end all. Like I'm dedicated to coming back in here, getting Watershed back up and running in whatever capacity we need it to be. Because at that point in time, we still didn't know, do we need to change concepts? Like, what is the dining scene like after the pandemic? We knew there was going to be some struggles, like with hiring and stuff like that. Basically, I was like, I know I'll I'll commit to getting you guys back up and running and through the majority of the struggle of whatever that is, you know, six months or so. But know that I'm probably going to try to figure out what else is going on in my life. Because with that all in mind, you know, I finally got to a point where I was just felt like it was the right time. I wasn't going to work to do anything. They weren't pushing my ball forward and I wasn't pushing their ball forward anymore. Like I was truly just coming to work to fill in the gaps, you know, like, like I mentioned, staffing struggle. If you dined at Watershed coming back out of the pandemic, like you probably saw me busting tables because that's what I needed to do on a nightly basis to make sure that we were running well. I've got no problem with busting tables. None. It's enjoyable. But I also enjoy hanging out with my wife better. It's just not what I needed. It was in, I think, September when I told, started the conversation with Greg, like, hey, I know for a fact that I, I truly, I do want to move on out. I want to move out of Watershed. I want to start this business. And even then, I'm like, I have no timeline. Like, I want us to figure out an exit plan that says this is when everyone's comfortable for me to, to peel away. If that means I'm here for three months, great. If that means I'm here for a month and then on part time for two months, Great. Whatever it is, like, let's figure out what this plan is. So we started talking about that in September and, you know, we hired someone, we didn't hire a a new chef, like with the guys that were under me, Aaron Mercer took over my position. He'd been with me for almost the majority of the time that Watershed had been open. And another, another guy, Matt, who also stepped up to what would have been, Aaron was my sous chef. So Aaron stepped into the chef role. Matt moved into what would have been Aaron's role. Both of those guys had been with me for a long time. We hired a director of operations because I was really trying to run Watershed as well. Like not only was I trying to make sure the kitchen was running well, and that was the easy part for me, but I was also the guy like banging my head on the wall, trying to figure out like why our numbers were down or what, what kind of marketing strategies can we do? And 
not, I don't have any experience in that. I was just trying to learn with everybody else. As I was leaving, we, we hired someone uh, more of like a director of operations for the restaurant that could help oversee the entire thing and also not have to worry about running a kitchen at the same time. So as soon as that person got hired in, I basically stuck around kind of on call. I think November was technically my last payroll month. And I stuck around kind of on call through the month of December because it's usually a restaurant and in Watershed's case, it is the busiest month. Uh, it's a holiday season. You know, you have New Year's Eve, which is normally a huge night for most restaurants that are typical of Watershed's size and style of dining. And at the same time, we had COVID cases running wild. Many reasons that I want Watershed to still be very successful and, and, and run well, even though I'm not there. Like I still make my hot sauce there. My wife still works on the distillery side. I have friends that work there. So it's not like I want, you know, I wasn't giving the middle finger and like, fuck you, you figure it out. Like, so I stayed with them through December, just kind of on call. So if there was a COVID outbreak or if there was someone that needed to run expo, whatever needed done, like I was there to, to help, but they crushed it. And you know, I never really had to step in. Like I, I wasn't super worried about it. I would, but set that motion in progress. So truly I would say December is my first month that I didn't touch really anything at Watershed and the new regime ran it. But I'm still there. Like I said, every day, I'm still using their kitchen until the end of June to to make hot sauce. So I'm still in there all the time. I go in in the morning, make my sauce or bottle or whatever I'm doing that day and until the kitchen staff starts to show up. And then I'll, I'll peel out, I'll hang out and talk for a little bit and then peel out. So I'm still very in tune with what's happening there. I just uh, don't have to be the person of responsibility for it. With your hot sauce, how big of batches are you cooking? It sounds like you're doing hand bottling for the most part, right? I'm a one man show. Make it like I for a minute, I bottle it, I label it. I'm the guy you're talking to. If someone orders it, I'm the guy that's delivering it. Only other person involved is my wife. She goes with me. Nikki runs, helps me run markets when we do markets on the weekends and stuff because it's too busy for one person to do sometimes. So, and I can't fit it all in one car. We'll do, you know, like the farmers markets and stuff as a couple. But I make probably six gallon, technically they're five gallon batches. I have six gallon fermenter buckets. Like if anyone out there has ever made beer at home, there's a very classic pale, you know, like the brewer's pale. It's got an airlock on the top of it. That's what I make it in. I have a recipe dialed into one of those buckets. Everything goes into it. It's a 30 day ferment at room temperature. I never cook it or pasteurize it or anything like that. So it's a total living culture ferment. So just think just like your sauerkraut or kombucha that you have to buy out of the refrigerator at the store. So I have my recipe done that everything that goes into that bucket, there's like no waste after that, like all the liquid in there, it's everything. I thicken it up after I blend it, bottle it, label it, and it goes back into the fridge. And one man show keeps me busy. It keeps me busy as I want to be, I should say that. Actually, I should back up and say this whole project would not be for for two things. If I didn't have my wonderful wife who still has a job and had a job all through the pandemic, and we learned through the pandemic because I wasn't bringing any well, I had unemployment, but we learned that you know we could survive off per salary. I, I'm fortunate for that. There's tons of people out there that can't say that. And there's tons of people out there that can't just walk away from a job, someone else's, you know, their spouse's salary to rely on. And the fact that I'm in the position that I can and want to, and, and my wife also wants me to, that was a great opportunity that I have. The second opportunity is the, the fact that all of these folks that I've met in the 13 or 12 years of cooking that were excited for me to do this project, the second that I made you know, 20 bottles of hot sauce in my first little bucket, they're like, we want it, you know? So I never had to be a salesman in the beginning because I'm definitely not a salesman. I'm, I'm a chef. So like when I made this, my first couple cases I had of hot sauce is literally my, my buddy, Jeremy, that I had just mentioned up in Cleveland, Jeremy Mansky. He's like, oh, you're selling that? Sweet. Bring me two cases. You know, like I'll take it. Never tasted it. Didn't ask me a price. Not nothing. Like bring it up. We'll sell it. And if I didn't have those types of relationships, again, I wouldn't be able to be doing this project. So those two things made this so much easier. I, I started to say that, like, I'm, I'm working as much as I want to now. Like I work about 20 hours in the kitchen a week and I might spend 20 more hours out delivering, but it's a good 20 hours out delivering. You know, like most of the time I'm in the car driving to Cleveland or driving around Columbus, listening to music. Most of the time I'm going to an establishment that's someone that I either worked with in the past, or I know you from some reason. So I kind of kick it with my friends for a few minutes while we, while I drop off hot sauce and that's it. It's not going to be like that forever. Uh, definitely understand that because I'm, you know, it's not like I'm making a ton of money on that right now, but coming out of the chef game, I recognize that one, my mental health was not in good status and I needed to, I asked why I wanted to reset. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to work 80 hours again. I'm okay with working 80 hours and I got myself in a position where those 80 hours would be all for me. I'm not in a hurry to get back there. So I really want to just take some time, enjoy life, enjoy the things that, you know, I already mentioned in this podcast about that are important to me now. 
and at the same time, build this brand. So far, it's going really good. Yeah. So how do you keep the taste and like the flavor consistent? I don't know all the ingredients that go in there, but peppers, I'm assuming are in there and peppers are different every time. So how do you keep the flavor profile the same? Honestly, the only thing I can do is just try to keep my recipe as consistent as possible when I'm when I'm making it. Part of the reason why I love fermentation is because a lot of times it's not something that you can easily replicate to an exact science over and over and over again without the use of some crazy man-made machinery. But on the simplest level of something like making sauerkraut, you cut cabbage, you salt it, you put it into a crock. Some form of bacteria is going to grow in there and make it sour, a form of lactobacillus. There's hundreds of forms of lactobacillus that all have their own little nuance of flavor. Any of those could start growing in there. So you know, it's affected by the temperature of where it's sitting at, the humidity in the room. You know, when I make in that setting, I have rubber gloves on, but like at home, you know, whatever bacteria might be on your hands, if you're not wearing gloves, all of that affects fermentation. And what I do to try to keep it consistent, my recipe is broken down into weight. It's really simple, like five ingredients, I think, peppers, lime zest, ginger, garlic, all by weight in grams. So the same amount of weight goes in every single time, the same amount of water goes in, same amount of salt goes in. So Everything that I'm personally doing is exactly the same by weight all the time. Chia seeds is the last, that's what I use to thicken it. So, but those, those don't go into the fermentation part. So all that goes into a bucket and they all sit on the same shelf. I'd make about 20 buckets a month, between 15 and 20 buckets a month. I don't make them all at once. Like I'll, like today I made one and got some stuff set up for tomorrow's day. Uh, keeps me from having to do like eight hours of work in one day, just getting all busted out. It's going to a couple hours here and there. So I keep them all on the same shelf. So they're all exposed to the same temperature and humidity. It's not like one sitting in this room and one sitting in this room. And e- even with all of that, there are buckets. The average person that eats the hot sauce that you know bought a bottle last month and they bought a bottle this month, they're not going to notice too much difference in the flavor profile. You will notice a little bit difference in the heat. And that's just the nature of peppers. Like especially with Fresnos, they're, they're one of those peppers that sometimes they're here on the Scoville unit and tomorrow they might be a little bit higher or, or tomorrow they're a little bit lower. So that does fluctuate a little bit. And that's not, that's not a me thing. That's just the uh, farmer and weather thing. And, you know, it's, it's watering cycle and the pepper was being grown. But once I get it and, and ferment it, when I have multiple buckets open in the kitchen, each individual batches, like it was last week, I think I had three open at once and it was pretty, pretty cool all three buckets smelled a little different. All three tasted a little different when I'm tasting them side by side, but it's not really enough for the average person to pick up on those nuances. Why are they different? I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Fermentation, like whatever on a molecular level, whatever strand of bacteria in there that grew that makes that beneficial and safe, slightly different than the one next to it. Even on buckets that I literally did the same day, like, and I, it just comes out different. It's the, for lack of a better term, the, the terroir of what went into that bucket or that vessel is what created the end product. I only manipulated around, along the way. You know, I think that's something that has fascinated me from the beginning with fermentation, because as a chef, as a line cook, that's what you do is make the same thing over and over and over and over again on a nightly basis and replicate it. You know, like I mentioned before, like the short rib that went on the plate at five o'clock needs to be the same short rib that went on the plate at nine o'clock, no matter how many you did in between there. The fact that all of a sudden that I can, I can make the same recipe over and over and over and over. And every time it comes out just a little nuance different that, and I don't really have that much control over it or under or why. And, and it's, I don't know, it's mysterious to me. I think it's the reason that uh, I've been attracted to it for so long. So How competitive is the world of hot sauce now that you're doing these markets and stuff like that? Competitive may not be the right word to use, but it's definitely saturated. There's a lot of hot sauce out there. Um, There's not very many. Like I mentioned, I'm a a refrigerated hot sauce. I never cook it or pasteurize it because I want those fermentation probiotics in it. There's so which that that complicates things because I'm, I'm a refrigerated product. There's so many people out there that may ferment their hot sauce to get the flavor profile that they want, and then they cook it so that they bottle it and it becomes shelf stable and stuff like that. But at that point, yeah, they can sell it cheaper. They can be out on the product. They can be on a non-refrigerated shelf, that kind of stuff. But all of the good things that I like about the gut health, the probiotics of it are gone once you cook it. That's not really what I wanted to do. There's definitely a lot of folks in the hot sauce world. They're all very friendly. This is why I didn't want to say like sometimes competitive doesn't always mean friendly. And I, I definitely haven't encountered anyone in, in this industry yet that hasn't been just excited to see me come into the industry and have a, a new face to it and a new style and 
most people are just curious to see what product's going to be next. So it's been welcoming group of individuals and not just hot sauce. The fact that I'm at, you know, these little makers markets, doesn't matter if you're a hot sauce or a, or a vintage clothing or a wallet maker or whatever, like all the people that I've encountered so far in that world of startup entrepreneurship has been fantastic. All just seemingly, I don't want to say like-minded, but cool to be around, you know, to go to a market and everyone that's there, like they're hustling, you know, like they're, they're putting themselves out there. They're selling their, their thing. They're excited to talk to you. You know, they want to trade products with you and stuff like that. It, it, that's really cool to be around. It kind of goes back to like, I was saying, like, I like to be surrounded by people that are proud of what they're doing versus me trying to convince them that this is the better way to do it. And like standing between a couple other vendors that are proud of what they do, it gives you that more sense of confidence to stand at your own table and Hey, come over here and taste some hot sauce as opposed to just like sitting down and letting someone walk up to me. Like it makes me want to get out there and sell myself a little bit more. So the people I've encountered so far on this, on this section of my journey have been helpful and and friendly and, and welcoming for sure. What condiment is kind of the next that you think you'll take on when you originally kind of launched Black Cab? It's a condiment company. It's not just strictly a hot sauce company. So like, what's the next thing that you're kind of eyeballing? Honestly, I'm not 100% sure. You're right in that. We wanted it to be a condiment company. So on the bottom of our hot sauce, on our, on our label, you'll see Black Cap, obviously. Black Cap is just the product. We, the brand we create is Ruffled Feather Ferments. And, and that's what's in, truly intended to be, hopefully, a, a small batch condiment company with the idea that Black Cap is the flagship. You know, It's the product that will take coast to coast. It's the product that we put the marketing dollars behind and the strategy behind because hot sauce is kind of a hot market right now. And so is fermentation. So as far as that goes, what's the next condiment or product? I honestly don't know. I have a couple of different avenues in my head that I've thought about. You know, it could be another sauce uh, or it could be another hot sauce, um, but I don't really want to cannibalize the sales of what the other hot sauce is. You can only eat so much hot sauce in a week's time, which is why I haven't committed to like weekly farmers markets and stuff yet is because, uh, you know, I'm not there yet. So I'll definitely do other hot sauces. I want to do another, uh, a hotter hot sauce because Black Cap is... It's a really good all-purpose sauce. It's not going to melt your face off by any means. So like, I do want a hotter one. I really love vinegars, mustards, soy sauces, but I honestly just don't know what the next step is going to be yet. And the main reason that I don't know that is because for as long as I'm at Watershed, which is a great, convenient place for me to make it, I don't have the room to like spread my wings out there and truly like take up a larger footprint to be able to spin off some products. I know you know, probably just enough to be dangerous when it comes to like running a business, especially a startup business. But what I I felt that right now, as opposed to trying to come up with a catalog of products and stretch myself thin, and, and I'd rather just focus on one. Let's build this one. Let's build this brand. Let's build this kind of following so that when we do release another product, people have the excitement and they, they want to see what's coming from, from Black Cap or from Ruffled Feather versus Hey, here's these three different hot sauces or these, you know, these vinegars and mustards and whatever. And, and no one really has an excitement about what our brand is in the first place. So I, for the moment, we're just keeping it to the one. But the second that I have a, a little bit more of a permanent space, I'm going to start branching out and prototyping some recipes on what might be, might be next. But for now, I'm still just kind of focusing on keeping my, growth in line and understanding what that balance looked like because it's not you know it's fermented product so if i ran out today i won't have any more for like 35 days the last thing i want to do is go out and get a bunch of customers that are excited about it like wholesale customers like other restaurants or retailers and then all of a sudden i don't have it for them for 35 days so again going back to being in the position that i'm in and not needing to make a ton of money off of this in the very beginning it's allowed me to grow this very organically debt free for the most part you know, what little bit of money I'm making on it, I'm just directly putting back into it. Like the second that I have some extra money, sweet, let's buy more fermenter buckets or let's buy more, you know, let's keep scaling up and getting a few more customers. So it's been really, I don't say challenging and like, it's a struggle. Like it's a new challenge, a new set of things for me to learn. It's a new set of systems for me to learn. I, you know, I'll be the first person to admit, I don't like working by myself. It's where I'm at right now. The next six to eight months, as I get into a new space and think about those products is exciting to me. Like I haven't, even though I don't know what it is, I'm excited to be able to just play around with some recipes and get some people's feedback on it and ask around, see what other people want to see me do. And I'll probably be back in a restaurant at some point someday. This condiment company has never been intended for me. This isn't going to be where I retire from. Like this was intended to be something that's going to be a revenue generator. And I hope to grow this big enough that I can hire someone to run this portion of what we're doing. And maybe I'll find my way back into a restaurant, but that's pipe dream. We'll see where it goes. 
Do you think because of COVID, there was virtual wine tastings, numerous restaurants pivoted to to go food that they never even offered before, never even had ideas of figuring that whole thing out. Meal kits, places were doing, even like farms were selling off produce baskets and stuff you could get where before they were exclusively involved with restaurants and, and things of that nature. Do you think more restaurant owners, more chefs, people in that world now have to have a multiple revenue stream set up something in the CPG space or something to survive now? I don't know if it's necessarily now. When I look at the type of restaurants that I like working in, which are normally passion projects, when I think about like the Black Pigs of the world, like we were printing money at Black Pig. Like I'd never seen the numbers there. I couldn't tell you what we were doing, but I'm not stupid in the sense of like, I can count how many seats we have in a dining room. I can count how much money a person's spending on average. And I can count up the salaries in the kitchen to know that if you're looking to make, to get rich or to make a, a, you know, a killing salary, like you're probably not starting a restaurant. The reason people get into the restaurant world is usually not money motivated. Going back to like 2018, when we're talking about how do we get other people in here or how do we get other people to see me? I mean, part of that was probably, yeah, thinking in my head, like five years from now, if I ever have my own restaurant of my own, it's probably not going to be a, it's going to be a revenue generator, but it doesn't mean it's a profitable revenue generator. Sometimes it's going to take money and sometimes it'll profit money. And that's kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to a small restaurant. Having something like a CBG company, I don't know this for a fact, but I think that their revenue stream isn't quite as wavy as a restaurant's P&L may look like. I think it'd be easier to see some solid growth in a CBG company. And also a restaurant always has a ceiling. There's always a max number of seats that you can do. And eventually you can't do any more. And if you want people to stay with you in a restaurant and work there for five years or more, they obviously have to have increases in salaries as, as well as are there. So like restaurants just get tighter and tighter to run as the longer they're there, especially as people tenured there. So like going back to that question, like I don't know that the pandemic is the reason that you might need multiple revenue streams to be successful. Definitely magnified it. It definitely showed how people can be creative and find resourceful revenue streams within what they're already doing. And I applaud people that made those pivots. Some companies can't pivot or some folks just don't, don't have the brain power to understand how to pivot like that. I don't know that it's pandemic related. That, And I, I, don't, I don't even want to say that you need another revenue stream to be successful. There's definitely successful restaurants out there. I don't have the perfect formula for it. The people that I've been working with don't have the perfect formula for it. I knew that if this type of restaurant that I would re- find myself working in as, as mine, as a passion project, if I ever get there, probably not going to be a big 200 seater restaurant that's turning and burning 10 grand in a night. It's I've been there and I've left there. You know what I mean? Like it's just not, that's not my idea of uh, having to work thinking about what's going to happen. When you get to that day, there's shit to be done and, and work to do. And a, lot, and a lot of people that's going to come through your doors. And that's, I love it. Don't get me wrong, but that's, that's not what I want to do for the rest of my life. You said in an interview, paraphrasing, but basically you're just leaving the restaurant world for now, not permanently. You know, that's obviously what you've been doing for most of your career, aside from the mechanic stuff early on. But that right now, the restaurant game you're playing is different than the one that it was 10 years ago. What exactly did you mean by that last part there, that it's how much it's changed in the last 10 years? It's a different game. In that specific moment, you know, it was a big reference to the types of dining struggles that the pandemic was pushing us into. You know, at that time, there was still six foot rules in the dining room, like tables had to be six feet apart. People had to wear masks when they were standing. Before, going back to the numbers of a restaurant, it's always tight running a profitable restaurant. It's hard to run a profitable restaurant. So then at a place like Watershed, when the six foot rule came into effect, like that literally in our dining room took out almost 45, if not more percent of our seating. Even though it's in a warehouse space, like we don't, the way it's set up, we didn't have a ton of room. So now all of a sudden, when we were at 100% capacity, our numbers were tight. And now I'm expected to do the same thing with half the amount of seating and with half the amount of staff. That alone was very challenging. And then on top of that, the diner that's coming in, in the beginning, there was a lot of diners that were very supportive and just excited to see you open and coming back to support you in that sense. But let me tell you, after the two week honeymoon phase of coming back, The 25th person I had to tell to put the mask on walking in the front door and to give me feedback from it, like give me shit because I'm making them put a mask on. I'm like, it's not my rule, man. Go to city council if you want to complain about it. Like, I I don't know what else to tell you. Like, 
the the city says that I have to require you to put a mask on inside my establishment. So please put a mask on while you walk to your fucking table and sit down. That kind of stuff. And I'm not putting the blame on anyone. Like I get it. It sucks. But that type of stuff like sucked the life out of restaurants for me. Like it just wasn't fun anymore to go out and talk to the tables. Like, and, and I get it. Some people are scared. Some people are, you know, some people don't know if they feel comfortable in that setting. Some people, you know, maybe you have elderly parents that you're trying to dine out with and you're, and you feel unsafe that they're in there. The people next to you don't have a mask on. Like I, I'm not saying, I'm not telling people how they should feel. It's just people don't know how to direct those feelings. And especially when you're in a restaurant, a service staff has, for centuries has already takes a beating on what is the expectation because you're a server. It just wasn't fun anymore. That's all. That's all I can really say. Like, well, like, like I said earlier, like that you get to go out into a into a dining room, like we're closing out Black Pig, and every single person in there applauds you when you walk out because you want to talk to them about your dish. It's a lot different when you have twenty five people a night, you know, yelling at you because you made them put a mask on. Or, or yeah, it just wasn't fun, man. It wasn't the same. I spent way more time just trying to figure out how to keep people comfortable and how we're going to afford to buy plastic barriers or switching to QR code or whatever. Like I. Was so far away from what we started doing five years ago and what I what I found to love 10 years before that, just being on a hotline cooking food. And it just boiled back to like what I was saying earlier. Like, man, like I get it. This is what someone's job needs to be right now. And it's just it's not it's not the job I need to be doing. Like I don't I don't know how talking to the 25 people who walked in upset at me, push my career ball forward anymore. Yeah, I just, I just didn't want to do that anymore. And hopefully now that we're getting it back to a little bit sense of I'm sure that's happening less. Also with like price increase, like I say all of that, that was all stuff very COVID related, but like the increase of like all the stuff that I have to buy, you know, fryer oil used to be like $18 a jug and now it's $60 a jug to charge more for things that are, you know, French fries or fingerling potatoes or things that are normally been this price all along. And people don't want to hear that. And I'd get tired of explaining that. And, and, you know, I get tired of like trying to crunch the numbers in a different way because this is inflating over here and we can't inflate it on this side. It just wasn't, best thing I can say, it just wasn't fun anymore. Yeah, I think you're articulating a lot of stuff that led to a big chunk of why people left restaurants and there was such a staffing shortage and stuff like that. I think it was a lot of that stuff too. And then also, you know, pay and and whatnot and being reduced capacity. If you're a server, you're not taking on the same amount of tips that you were before. And it's like, is this even really worth it if I have to deal with all this extra stuff and I'm making less money now? Like, why am I still doing this kind of thing? So I completely understand what you're saying. Do you think you would have reached the same conclusion if you already didn't have like black cap and everything kind of in the work since 2018? Like you had this side project that I don't want to say you could fall back on, but you could turn your attention to. Do you think you would have still made the same decision? Like, yeah, I'm gonna take a break from restaurants for a while and focus on this. I don't know, honestly, because you're hundred percent right in the sense that having that alternative, having black cap there that I could focus my attention on was definitely the easy out. I think I was at a point, if Black Cap wasn't a thing, I, I probably still would have left Watershed, I, but it probably would have been a little more strategic. I didn't want to go to a, someone else's restaurant. I didn't want to do exactly what I was doing. If I'm going to work in a restaurant, I wanted it to be mine, or at least I reaped some of the direct benefits that could come off of that. So I think if I was, if I didn't have Black Cap, what I probably would have done was started the route of how do I how do I go about finding investment or raise capital to do a project of my own? But I, I was definitely to a point recognizing the amount of work that it was taking to run a restaurant and that I didn't want to do it for Watershed anymore because of that. I was, I was going to have to find something uh, that lined up better with the schedule that I wanted to do, whether it was a restaurant or not. So I think the, the me leaving Watershed probably would have been prolonged. It would have been drug out a little bit, but ultimately I still would have, I still would have left because Black cap or not, it doesn't hide the fact that what I, the good things that the pandemic put back into perspective for me, like I was saying, like being able to spend time with my wife and being at home and all that kind of stuff that I want to experience. And uh, if that, regardless of black cap was there or not, that still would be, which would ultimately push me out of watershed in some capacity. And that, it's because watershed is a a dinner house. You know what I mean? Like it's dinner only. There's no lunch. There's not breakfast. I kind of have to be there in the evenings. Uh, It wasn't an option to go in and run breakfast in the morning kind of thing. Yeah, I just think it would have been a little more strategic move to get into either a restaurant that was mine or, or a restaurant schedule that fit what I needed better. But I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm really not sure on that. I was at the same time that I was coming to all those conclusions. I was re- like really learning a lot about myself as far as my mental health goes, and like understood that the ten years I had spent in the service industry, although it was great for my career, like wasn't wasn't great for my mental health, and I really needed to 
focus on that a little bit and get myself back under control before I just went back into a restaurant. I don't know if or if I would have landed back in a restaurant immediately or not. I'm not 100 sure. It's a good question. I've definitely seen it change. You know, I think about back to when I first started Sage. Some of the the restaurants that were on the scene then were I, I, I don't know how to say this. Like Sage was unique in a sense of like the type of food we put out, but I felt I felt like it was kind of on par with all the other Columbus restaurants, like the Rigsby's of the world. Like it was a different size. Don't get me wrong, but you know the Rigsby's, the the G Mike's sages of the world like you could go to those establishments and get for the most part the same style of service the same same level or care of food you know like the food was different styles don't get me wrong but a chef has put the same passion behind it and made sure that it was hot and seasoned and and, and got out to your table that it wasn't just large corporate con- conglomerates putting things out you know flash forward to now like i feel like there's more of those popping up the ability for restaurants like the, the sage American beasters of the world to, to have a chef owner want to live his dream out and pop up. I feel like that's easier to happen now, especially after the pandemic. There's tons of restaurants that are closing up shop and real estate places need to plug people into them to keep them rolling. So I feel like now more than ever, you can start your passion project. And I, I don't really know if that's good or bad. I think it's good because I get to see a lot of people trying their stuff and I get to see a lot of restaurants pop up and things I hadn't seen before or, you know, great for ethnic food, not necessarily on the top 10 list, but crazy food options in this city when you're when you expand to the 270 outer belt and maybe a little past that so i I think it's headed in a good direction i think it's headed in a challenging direction because i think there's still a huge sense of uncertainty on what the dining scene uh is and wants like with the pandemic like you mentioned everyone has this everything changed The, the door dashes of the world became huge and switching to to go meals and food that you can prep at home, all that kind of stuff. Like I don't have a grasp on how much of that you need to have as a restaurant now to stay on par because that's, that has changed people. Like not everyone just wants to go out to a restaurant anymore because maybe they don't feel safe in a restaurant setting, but they would love to order food from that restaurant to bring home and reheat or to have that carry out. And like when I was at watershed, like we didn't hardly do carry out at all. Like the food that we were making was not intended to go into a corrugated box and go home. It was intended to go into a plate. And for you to eat it there. So like, it's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different design of menu concept and and way you lay your hotline out and everything and and the the things you have to buy in a restaurant. So I think it's really challenging to understand like how much of your dining, how much of your, you know, your customers that you may have had before now really want you to do to go stuff or, you know, maybe those same people have found new restaurants. Like they're not coming back to you because of for, for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's a health benefit. They don't want to eat 18 ounces of pork belly bacon anymore. You know, they're, they're going somewhere that has healthier options. There's so many things that happened during the pandemic that changed people's perspective on what was important to them. Perfect case, you know, scenario for that. But that happened a lot to the dining scene as well. And I, I don't have a good grasp on what it takes to be the like successful food establishment right now, because it's still very uncertain. I say that a little bit with um, also at the same time, like as a chef, I don't, I don't really want to get involved in doing to go food. You know, like that wasn't something that I really wanted to do. So I see those things popping out, you know, and I think that's, I think that's all really cool. I support those. So where it's headed, it's, it's really hard for me to say, I don't know. Like I, I still see restaurants that are similar to like watershed that are still popping up. I'm wondering if they're going to make it. I see concepts popping up that are take and bake style food only. And I wonder how long it's going to make it because that's unheard of to me. I'd ever, I would never go to a rep like, like to me, that's like grocery shopping. You know what I mean? Like you go to the store and buy the frozen lasagna to plug in. Like I've never bought a tray of lasagna from a restaurant to go home and bake off myself, but I support it. And I, and, and I, I, I want those people to be successful. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't really know where we're headed, honestly. And to tell you the truth, while I'm not in the restaurant game, I'm not thinking a whole lot about it. That is not a worry. I need to burden myself with this moment. I definitely see it. I definitely kind of pay attention to it a little bit, but I honestly have, outside of you asking me that question, like I haven't really put much thought into it on where it's going. Like when I think about myself getting back into the restaurant world someday, when I get to the point of stepping back into the restaurant world, I'm just going to have to take a step back and look and be like, okay, this is, this is the scenario we're in right now. Where do I, where do I fit in? Can I fit, can I fit back into this? As far as like what Columbus needs, I, I'm still in the boat that I think we need more diversity in this city. I think we need more diversity spotlighted in this city. Like I, I made the comment that we have like great ethnic food, but it is a struggle for those ethnic food people to make it to a top 10 list like I was on. 
I don't have a reason why it is or isn't that way, but I, I definitely think we need more diversity. People need to be educated about their food and, and have their eyes opened a little bit, which has come a long way for sure. I've used the reference before, like how, you know, this, how the city has changed a little bit. When I was at Sage, you know, we did things really like that was like the highest elevated food I had seen at that point in time. And then the thought of putting something like a pig head on the menu at Sage would have been a terrible idea. Like no one would have bought that. And then I go to Greenhouse, you know, months later and, a, you know, a whole roasted halves pig heads on the menu. And not only do we sell a couple, we sell so many that we like every day we run out of them sometimes. Like you might sell 15 pig heads in a night. And I'm like, that's insane. Like the restaurant I came from in Columbus would have never bought that. But now that's hundred percent the case. Like an 18 ounce bacon steak is not far from that, you know? And I think part of that is like understanding where your food comes from. And people get pretty weirded out when they see a whole, like a pig's head on a platter. But I think it's really important that people understand that that's where that comes from. And I think there's a still a severe amount of education that needs to happen in our city. And I simply only say in our city, because I just think, you know, we're big, we're, we're like a giant suburb, you know, we're a really big city and it's, you know, I never saw a pig's head growing up uh, eating like that. And I, I wouldn't have known what to do with it either. You know, I want to see the boundaries continually being continually being pressed, the whole nose to tail movement, the, the farm to table movement. You know, I don't like using those buzzwords. Like I never use those buzzwords at Watershed because to me, that's just like common sense, how you should run a restaurant. Like, don't like, I'm not doing anything new by being farm to table. That's just my philosophy, how food should be. And if that's, and if you agree with that philosophy, then you should eat at my restaurant kind of thing. So I want to continue to see things like that happen in our city. I want to see more diversity and, and people speaking up for themselves, standing up for themselves, putting out, you know, don't be afraid to take your burger off the menu. If you got something else selling on there, like if you can make it happen without giving them the burger, then whatever the equivalent is to your burger that, that was mine, like then do it and then be smart about it. I don't hundred percent know what that is. And I'm not, not sure the direction we're headed, but I'm, I'm down for the ride. I'm, I'm going to watch it, see where it ends up. Part of me, like I'm a little hurt at that a little bit. Like, honestly, like it was a big thing for me leaving watershed because I didn't, one of the biggest things for me to overcome, I put a lot of, this is the anxiety in me coming out. Cause you always, you assume the responsibility of things that shouldn't be yours when you have high anxiety and being a chef in, in the city that you have other people looking up to you and me saying everything I just said, like, you know, it wasn't fun anymore to deal with the COVID stuff. Like I just didn't want to do it. Anymore. Like all these things that were challenging, like I really wish I could be the guy that had answers to all these challenging things and, and the systems to these challenging things that people could look at me and be like, oh, that's how you get through this. That's how you change. That's how we pivot instead of being the guy that's like, you know what, I'm, I'm out. You know, ultimately it goes back to what I said my priorities were. And then it doesn't matter if I figure out how to make a restaurant successful or not. It doesn't change the amount of time I got to spend at home and, and do what was truly important to me. Glad that change is there. What's next for you professionally? I mean, obviously you have Black Cap doing some markets and stuff like that, working on expanding, but what else? Not right off the rip, honestly. I would love to grow Ruffled Feather to a point that I could employ someone or a couple people to truly run that half of it. And I could focus on new product development or you know, mainly just that. Like, I don't want to be a salesperson. Like, I don't want to be the person hitting the bricks or pounding the pavement every day, like trying to go out there and make cold sales calls. I don't want to be the person that has to run the market every single weekend. I don't want to be the person that has to hand bottle every single bottle of hot sauce either for now. So I'd love to get this to a point where someone could run and operate this and it be a successful revenue stream. The other two things that I have on my my forefront would be like, the idea of going back into some sort of restaurant setting or retail setting that offers food. I think that would be fun. And the other thing that I have is my parents, I mentioned that, you know, they have a, not a farm, but they have property where we always have a huge garden. And over the pandemic, I was able to, for that first year, we grew a lot of our own peppers in the garden for the hot sauce. So I was able to just to file the paperwork, like you would start any other business to, to truly set it up as an LLC that I could essentially buy peppers from my parents to make in the hot sauce. And I would love to turn that into more of a actual business. Like we see so many farmers that come in and out of the restaurants now that, you know, they don't necessarily work with retailers. They don't, they might be at farmer's markets and whatnot, but those are the guys we love in our, in, in my industry, the, the, the farmers that just walk in one day, they've got boxes of beautiful produce and, you know, you know, they're coming on every Friday or whatever it is. And it's kind of whatever they got, they, they got. 
there's plenty of guys I work with like that. Like you're not placing orders with them. They show up, you walk around their van, like it's a Kroger and you pick out the things you want. I would love to have the ability to turn my parents' property into something that operated like that and, or worked in conjunction with what ruffled feather ferments would be, you know, utilizing local produce and seasonal produce and all that kind of stuff. And if I can find a way to use the things that we're growing on the farm in that company, then I would love for them to work hand in hand, like a, you know, kind of a brother sister relationship. And, and if I have a retail or, or hospitality establishment to push it into as well, like then great. You know, as far as like this Columbus scene goes and the Cleveland scene goes, if I found myself with a truck full of fresh vegetables, I'm pretty sure on any given Saturday, I could get rid of them at some restaurants. You know, I don't want to be a farmer necessarily. I enjoy going out in the summertime, but if I had the, the ability to get that up and running in any other way, I, I, it's something that really interests me and, and would fit into a complete story of my chef brand. But we'll see what comes of that. So this next question comes from Josh Martinez, the owner, CEO of Pretentious Barrel House here in Columbus. He was a previous guest on the podcast, so he left behind a question. What do you do when you're uninspired? I get in a cookbook, put music on, and cook. <laughs> I mean, I it's hard. It's, it's weird to say. Like, if I'm looking for inspiration, I'll definitely pull out a cookbook that either I haven't looked at in a while or one that's just maybe just been eyeballing me on the shelf for whatever reason. I'll put some good music on. I'm a big huge music nerd, trying something I've never cooked before. Even if it's like, I'm needing inspiration for a menu. And I may know for a fact, I'm not going to put what I'm making on the menu. But the fact that I'm just taking myself out of my element, making something I've never made before, trying it, understanding it, get my gears moving. And you know, I'm going to learn something from that, or I may pick up an idea from that. But I think truly just like cookbooks and music, the art of actually like cooking is what inspires me, which is real coming from like what I was saying as a chef of a restaurant, you're probably not cooking that much. You know, I didn't cook at Watershed. I ran it. I steered that ship. So the moments that I actually had to cook at Watershed are usually great and really inspiring. And, and most of the things that you would see me come up with on a special menu, if it wasn't coming from one of my guy's inspirations, it was probably me making something at home that I was like, oh man, that came out really cool. How can we turn this into a, a, a restaurant setting or a technique or What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? Can be anything. I would ask someone if they could choose any other career to be in to just reset and do it over. What would that career be? I have my favorite Bill story. Okay. Yeah. I was coming back to that. So hopefully Bill won't get mad when he hears this story because most stories that are like funny to someone else usually isn't someone else's shining moment. Um, and hopefully he can laugh about the situation now. And there's some other folks that have probably heard this story as well that would laugh if they heard it. But it's no stranger that uh, everyone usually knows that some chefs might have a short fuse or a hot head or have a, have, a, have a temper. And not that Bill had one of those, but we all have those moments where something upsets you to the moment that you kind of have an explosion. Normally, when those explosions happen, nothing good comes out of it. You feel better for a hot second because you release some energy. But normally, like shook everyone else up, or you or did something else. You know, it didn't make anything better actually. And uh, it was one of those moments where I learned that from Bill. Situation was, where it was just me and Bill on the line that day. Prep was pretty minimal. He had some stuff to take care of during the day, and he had a prep project that I didn't know how to do. So he he had to bust it out. He came in, started it. It was like I think we had like melt leaks and some butter to, to start. Sage Kitchen was small, so you'd think I'd be able to like help or see it but like i was around the corner so i couldn't really see what was going on long story short bill came in started this project we had kind of just enough time to get it done and right off the rip in the rondo which is like a big pot he burnt the leaks and we didn't have any more leaks to start it over and he was madder in hell and he wasn't mad at me or anything. he was mad at himself picked the rondo up and just like launched it at the dish pit just like threw it fuck this thing and when it hit the dish pit it hit the faucet and just bent it straight down and it was like, oh, like he like walked over to like bend it back up. And like when he did it, just like broke. So like now not only did he have pain with burnt leaks in it that we couldn't fix, he now also needed to fix the faucet that he, that he broke off if we were wanting to do any dishes that night as well. It was one of those moments like in that moment, it was a rough day. Like thinking about it now, like I hope Bill remembers that and can laugh at it pretty hard because it's it's definitely a moment that I that I laugh at. And, we all had multiple learning experiences like that along the way. And that was one of those times. I've definitely had my blow ups and done shit like that. So that was one of my first moments as a really young line cook seeing it happen. And I was like, oh shit, that guy's pissed off and then broke something else. Like I said, Bill's a friend of mine. I, I would never say anything bad about him. It was a, I hope he could laugh at the same story. So 
Next question comes from one of our listeners. If your hot sauce black cap made it onto the lineup for the next season of Hot Ones, if you're not familiar, it's a YouTube show. About 10 chicken wings are usually a guest. They interview, for anybody that's listening that doesn't know, it's about like 20, 30 minutes, but they get progressively hotter. So if your hot sauce was selected and, and made it onto the show, where would it fall in the lineup between 1 and 10, with 1 being the most mild, no heat, and then 10 being the hottest one that they have? I definitely wouldn't be in the hottest one. I haven't watched a ton of the hot ones. I have had some of the hottest hot sauces that have come off of there before. So I, I know what they're dealing with on there. And I'm, I'm definitely not up there. I, I feel like Black Cap is pretty middle of the road. Even on the side of the hot sauce bottle, I have it labeled as mild, mild on heat, wild on flavor. It's only Fresno's in there. So it's not like there's any like habaneros or reapers or anything like that. So it can only be as hot as Fresno's can be. I'd have to put myself at a solid five in the dead total middle of the scale there. Like there's definitely more milder sauces than me, but there's easily fine hotter hot sauces than, than Black Cat. So this last set of questions, we ask everybody who comes on the podcast, nice compare and contrast across all the episodes. Who would you say is the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far? Can be anybody. Like, are we talking about professionals or just anybody in life? Anybody. I guess it's probably like the, the cliche answer here, but when it comes to like work ethic, probably my parents, you know, they're blue collar, hardworking, either construction or factory worker people that would bust their ass at no limit to make sure that they had everything that they needed at home. We didn't have everything that we wanted growing up, but we had everything that we needed. My parents did that doing whatever they did. Not, neither one of them had any type of like glorious job growing up. Like no press articles came out about my parents at any time in their life or anything like that. So like in my head, they're just true representations of people that did, I guess, the the American dream, you know, like they got a decent paying job, they got a family, they got a house, they got off work from their job every day at the five or six o'clock hour and came home and hung out with their family and went back to work and did it again Monday through Friday. I think that uh, we were definitely never handed anything in life, for sure. Like everything, we worked hard for it and we're proud of it. Because of that, you know, if you got something nice, you took care of it. I think just as far as work ethic goes, like I definitely got motivated and inspired by my parents. If I had to narrow it down and say like, who's influenced my specific cooking the most and like in the kitchen world, I don't, I don't know if I have a strong answer for that, honestly. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I could credit any like one person in that sense. I think, uh, yeah, I don't have any, I don't, I don't have a solid answer for that. I think my cooking style has changed so much over the years. I don't really change. I'm just like, you know, fluctuates. Like you'll go through phases like, oh, I'm really interested in this Japanese style of cooking. I'm really interested in uh, fermentation. I'm really interested in whatever it may be. And like uh, no single person's influencing any of that. That's just simply letting your mind wander and having the resources to dig into whatever that thing you're wondering about is. But I definitely think I have to credit my parents to, to that. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Cake tester. Restaurant you'd recommend that isn't your own. So I'd say you can't recommend Watershed. Uh, here in town, Chapman's. Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant. So place you haven't been to that you want to visit and then place you haven't eaten at that you want to eat at too. Bucket list travel. Actually, just in a couple of weeks, I get to cross one off my bucket list. Uh, the wife and I, I've never been any further west than Texas, like Grand Canyon. That whole like desert area was something that's been on my bucket list. So the wife and I are actually going to Utah to Zion National Park for a week and just a couple of weeks. So that has been really high on my bucket list, like seeing the Grand Canyon, all the crazy mountain ranges that are out there, getting to check that off. In addition to that, I guess bucket list travel would be somewhere West Coast, Northern Pacific Rim, like what's that, like Big Sur or whatever, and like the crazy road that goes all along the Pacific Coast. I think that's something that I would love to see in my, in my lifetime that I don't have plans to see already. For whatever reason, one of the cookbooks I've been most interested in my entire life, which is probably on this shelf, La Pigeon, Gabriel Rucker's restaurant in Portland, Oregon. This is one of the first cookbooks I got. I've definitely spent a ton of time in this cookbook. I've got a lot of inspiration out of this cookbook before. I know people who know Gabriel Rucker as a chef. I don't personally know him. I've always kind of fanboyed out over him. I think his food's great. His story's great. So any of, he has a couple locations now, but I would love to to go check out his original spot. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? I'll give you two stories, both from Greenhouse. Uh, one of them I didn't see. I just happened to be there by proxy and like was one of the managers that had to deal with it. At Greenhouse, we had 
mezzanine. So there was the main dining room floor and then there was like an upstairs here and an upstairs here. Cleveland Indians home opening day. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. It's a madhouse. Fourth street It's just like shoulder to shoulder people. It's kind of like St. Patty's day. It's just nuts. Everyone's drinking all day. It's just like a giant party in all of downtown Cleveland, especially on fourth street right there. So on that day, table of drunk folks upstairs decided it would be funny if one of the ladies took her underwear off and launched him over the railing, which she did, and proceeded to hit a dude in the forehead on the table underneath them while the server was standing there taking an order. Uh, and he just gets hit in the head with a pair of dirty panties. James Beard award-winning restaurant, baby. You can get French fries, wings, $100 bottle of wine, dirty panties. That was one of those, like, did I get to see it? No. Uh, but the look on the manager's face coming down to ask me what they should do about it was, uh, I just couldn't believe I was having the conversation. I, I didn't know what to do. So that was interesting. The, the other craziest thing I've seen, I I watched a guy running fry one time. And if he ever hears this podcast, he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. And so will some other folks. It was scary at the moment, funny afterwards, but he was running a fry station, which was very busy at Greenhouse. Up inside the hood, there's these little pans that catch the grease as it drips out of the hoods. And at the end of every night, you know, you got to take this little grease trap down and dump it out. Someone had probably forgot to empty it out the night before. And it was dripping. I could see it dripping. And the way the line was set up there, it was dripping onto where his counterpart across from him, the saute guy, it was dripping on the saute guy's pans. So I yelled at the cook, not like at him, but like, you know, projected my voice like, hey, you got to change that. You're, you know, you're dripping shit on the on this guy's pans. And he's like, oh, OK. And being a he was a young kid uh, doing his intern there at the time. So he was kind of fresh out of culinary school and he just retch up and grabbed this pan that was full of was, was hot because we have been running fryers all night long. The second that he touched it, ow, ouch, like dropped it and just spilled this whole thing of grease down in the back of the fryer. So uh, I'm sure you don't know anything about a fryer, but the way a fryer works is in the back of it, that's a big vent. There's a big flame that's in there. And so someone just dumped a bunch of hot oil down it. So in the middle of our dinner rush, I have a fryer that has like three feet blue flames coming out of the back of it that I'm just waiting on the Ansel system to to go off. And luckily it didn't. It was a very tense moment in, in the kitchen for the to fryer to be on fire coming out of the back of it. Also made for a great time cleanup of dumping boxes and boxes of salt down the back and having to shot back it out all in the middle of the service to get the fryer back up and running because you just couldn't operate without it. Seeing, seeing the fryer on fire was definitely a crazy thing. Food or drink guilty pleasures or anything Fast food, candy, anything that you just, you know, is terrible for you, but you just can't help yourself. Yeah, I got a lot of those probably. As much as I hate having burgers on my menu, I fucking love eating cheeseburgers, man. It's hard not to. I grew up on fast food, so I love eating fast food. Uh, again, I try not to. I had a guilty pleasure of, of pop, soda pop. I used to be the guy that could easily crush 12-pack of Mountain Dew in a day's time, but I've I now... Save that for pizza night only. I try not to drink any soda pop throughout the course of uh, any other time. I'm trying to think if there's any like one thing that I like live and die on, but pizza is probably a big one for me, honestly. Actually, no, I'll back up and throw everyone. Uh, people that know me will know this, but some people hearing this will probably not know. Probably one of my favorite restaurants to go to. It's because I can turn my brain off is Olive Garden. I don't care. When I go there, I don't have to think about anything. I get free breadsticks. Like I'm not critiqued. That's part of my problem when I go to other places, other folks' restaurants or similar to Watershed. Like, it's hard to turn my mind off. And I'm like, oh, this is great, but I would have done this. And I, I'm paying attention to how many servers they have. Like, how do they do this? And blah, 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 blah. Like, I can go to a corporate restaurant and not think about any of that shit because I'm never trying to do it. I will go to the places like the Olive Garden and the Red Lobsters of the world any day of the week. Favorite Instagram account you follow? Mm, Eggs Tyrone, which is just someone posting dancing videos with music over it that's not what they're dancing to favorite dish or favorite thing that you ever cooked created looking back on your career you can kind of point to this as being almost like your aha moment like you knew you could be a professional chef probably the dish that i submitted to that san pellegrino competition which was a smoked bread pudding wrapped in call fat it was really fun i actually created that dish at greenhouse as a special normally bread puddings are sweet dishes, like a dessert. I made a savory one by smoking the bread and call fats or something that you wrap ground meat in, like making croquettes or a type of sausage or something. So it was not necessarily a vegetarian dish, but there wasn't any recognizable protein on the plate. It was just a bread pudding plate with some charred carrots and a carrot sauce. 
and that ate very savory. And that was something that that was the dish I took to that San Pellegrino competition. That was a dish that was that was on Black Pig's menu for a while that was raved about. It was on the opening menu at Watershed that was raved about. It was just happened to be one of those prep heavy dishes that when you're busting out 200 plus covers a night, it was hard to keep up with. So it didn't, it's life on the menu was small. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan. Not everybody is. If you were, is there a episode moment scene, you know, you always kind of remember if you weren't, is there another culinary personality that you just kind of gravitated towards when you're coming up through your career? Not necessarily. I am a big Anthony Bourdain fan. Honestly, I didn't watch a ton of his shows like the No Reservations. I watched bits, some like the areas that I was interested in, I would watch. I did read his book, Kitchen Confidential, when I was in like just getting into the cooking world. And it was really an amazing book for me. I love the way he wrote. You know, I didn't to say I liked Anthony Bourdain as a chef is not is not real. I like the spotlight he put on the industry. Him as a chef, I'm sure he was great, but like the restaurants he cooked at, like I don't think he even claimed to be a great chef. Like he just he grew up in the industry and understood what it took to go into it and the stories he wrote about. This, uh, you know, by the time I was getting to that game, is a bit of a dying culture. You don't, you know, it's not necessarily like that in restaurants these days. But it was almost like reading Kitchen Confidential as a, as a young chef. It was just like eye opening, and then like, oh man, that sounds like such crazy fun. Like all these crazy stories of things happening in the kitchen, or these crazy alcohol fueled and drug riddled people pulling off these crazy elaborate dishes at these Michelin star restaurants and stuff like that was just the things that went into it behind the scenes was just like, it sounded like a place that I was for lack of a better term, it sounded like a place that I was going to call home. Like I was going to be surrounded. If that was how it was with all these different types of individuals and everyone has their own problems and everyone's got to come together and work as a team, which is real. And I was really excited to be amongst a bunch of other weird individuals that was going to work together to make something really cool. And I don't know that I have a favorite scene or anything. I'm going to scroll through my Instagram really quick because the day he, he died, I did I posted one of my favorite quotes from him. I don't remember. I don't want to say it without butchering it. But I was a big Anthony Board. I was very sad the day that I learned he was gone because I do feel like his book was very influential on a lot of people. <laughs> All this stuff, not just the book. The book is what I read. He touched a lot of folks that was appreciated the spotlight he put on our industry. So the quote that I wrote on the day he passed was, quote, I'll be right here until they drag me off the line. I'm not going anywhere. I hope it's been an adventure. We took some casualties over the years. Things got broken. Things got lost. But I wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs> Even just reading that like that, that touches me. And that's it's just true. I've built some really cool friendships in the kitchen, ones that I still have to this day that are still my best friends. I wouldn't have them without the crazy shit that happened in the kitchen. Where can people find you? Social media, website, plug everything. Yeah, social media. So my personal social media is at J underscore more 87. Black Cap is at Black Cap Hot Sauce. That's the same on Facebook. You know, Jack Moore on Facebook, Black Cap on Facebook. I don't have a website or anything like that. That's the two easiest ways to find me. And if you follow my, so specifically the Instagram account more so than the Facebook one, but if you follow Black Cap, you can also find all the markets and retailers that you can find Black Cap in or markets that I will be working at behind the table, slinging sauce. It's been on a, a few dishes. I mean, I know it was on a couple of things at Watershed. Did you do something with Wario's that it might've popped up on? I mean, they definitely used it, Wario's and Coastal Local. Yeah, you can find it at Coastal Local. They have it in their little fridge. Here in Columbus, like Coastal Local carries it, Saddleburg, uh, which is also up in Bridge Park, the bottle shop on King Avenue, at Watershed, you can buy it from Watershed, uh, Hungarian Butcher, Hills Market downtown, quite a few small retailers in town. I'm, I know I'm missing people on that. Freedom All Carts Cafe, they, they also carry it. That Just as that many in, in Cleveland as well. But like I said, on, on, on Instagram, you can I have stories like where to buy stories that has everyone listed that has picked me up or carries me in some form. But yeah, the, the Coastal Local one, Going back to Wario's, Ian of Coastal Local, he was my fish guy at Watershed. Pretty much, I mean, I'm, I think they still use him. If you ate seafood at Watershed while I was there, there's more than a 100% chance that it came from those guys. So they, again, they were one of those awesome people that as soon as they heard I was slinging hot sauce, they're like, well, as soon as you have some ready to sell, just bring it down. We'll help. For Lint, I think that's what, just, I'm not a religious person at all, so forgive me if I'm butchering this. What, whatever just passed that everyone eats fish on Fridays for. Crystal Local and Crystal Local and Warriors, they did a special, like a shrimp special, used my hot sauce on it. So it was kind of like the, the the collab of all times. It was Warriors, Crystal Local, and, and me. Even all I had to do was just show up with the hot sauce and drop it off. They, they did the cooking half of it. But it, I love both of those 
I love uh, what Warriors has got going on. Uh, and I, I love Costa Local as well. So Appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your story and everything. We've had the hot sauce. I, I'm not an expert on hot sauce. It's good hot sauce. It's not super hot. I don't like like overly hot things. Um, that's just not me. I like to taste all the different components. So um, the things that I've had it on, it's worked. It's meshed well. It's been great. It's good to see it getting some traction and, and taking off too. And I, I think it'll continue to kind of blow up over the course of the the year. But yeah, if you ever need anything from us, feel free to reach out. We try and support everybody as much as we can, whoever comes on the podcast. So, you know, we'll reshare, you know, different stuff that you post, you know, if you're at a market or something like that too. But yeah, whenever, you know, you come out with a new product or something, feel free to hit me up. More than welcome to come back on. But yeah, really appreciate you coming on. Um, Stay in touch. Don't hesitate to reach out. Love doing stuff like this. And I'm always an open book when someone wants to ask a question. So it's fun for me and appreciate it. And that's it for this week. Big thanks again to Chef Jack Moore for coming on the podcast, taking some time to chat about black cap hot sauce and ruffled feathered ferments and his career at Watershed and before that too as well. So again, you can follow him on Instagram at J underscore Moore 87 and then also at black cap hot sauce. Again, follow us on Instagram. Make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. We're on all the major platforms, pretty much any of those smaller platforms you can find us too. Uh, New episodes come out every Thursday and then on YouTube, our YouTube channel, they'll come out a a week later. So if you use YouTube as your preferred podcast platform, then you're just running a week behind just because those things aren't integrated into podcasts. So YouTube's its own separate thing. But uh, appreciate everybody listening. Feel free to write in questions, comments, feedback. Uh, If there's a question that you ever wanted to ask a sommelier chef, restaurant owner, feel free to shoot it over to us. Uh, We'll try and incorporate it into the episode that if it's best, uh, depending on the guest and the lineup that we have coming up. So you can do that. Appreciate everybody who has been contacting us. More cool things on the way, cool episodes uh, coming up too as well. So we will talk to you guys next week.